and uh, and once again meeting with the Water Use Advisory Council uh, in in this virtual format. Uh, my name is Laura Campbell. I'm one of the uh, I'm one of the tri chairs of this uh, of this council, and I'm going to run us through uh, hopefully a quick procedure of making sure we've got acknowledged everybody who is participating in the meeting. Um, and then what I'm going to do is uh, separately from just from just making sure I've got everybody acknowledged who's on the who's on the call this afternoon. And I'm just going to run down the names real quick. If you're logged on through somebody else's system and I have called your name incorrectly, if you could please correct me. Otherwise, you don't need to say anything. I can see that you're logged on. And then for those on the phone, I'm going to ask you to identify yourselves. Laura, really quickly, this yes, is sir. James Lift. Yes. Uh, according to the new legislation, which authorizes virtual meetings, um, we need to have people identify themselves and where they're calling in from. The members need to identify their location that they're calling in from. It's okay. in the law. <laughs> so I'll just, just say it. Thank Again, you for that clarification. Critical. I missed that part. Uh, where where are you calling in from? Okay, so for, slight change here. Yeah, not as critical for a board like this because we're not making formal decisions but it's going to be a normal course of action these days will be uh, where who you are and where you're calling from. OK, very good. Thank you for that clarification. So uh, proving that we can be flexible and adapt. We'll uh, we'll switch over real quick here. I will run through role of the of the members of the of the council and ask you to uh, unmute yourself and reply and say where you are calling from and uh, and we will move forward through that and then I will try to run through uh, making sure that that we've got our guests who are uh, who are participating and and those on the phone acknowledged. OK, so Margaret Bettenhausen. If you can unmute yourself and let us know where you're calling from. Uh, <clears throat> hi, Laura, I'm here. I'm calling from East Lansing. OK, thank you. Uh, Tammy Newcomb. All right, Charlie Scott. Chris Alexander. I'm calling from Okemos, Laura. OK, thank you. Doug Needham. I'm calling from Okemos. Thank you. James Clift. Uh, Lansing, Michigan. Thank you. Steve Kohler. I'm in Kalamazoo. All right, thank you. Tom Zimnicki. Hey, Laura. Hey, Laura. Uh, Sorry, you, you blanked out there for a second. Can you say where you're calling from? Yeah, Lansing. Thank you. Yep. Dave Hamilton. That's what? All right, thank you. Frank Etiwajashik. Jim Nicholas. <clears throat> Jim, I wasn't sure if unmuting or not. I heard somebody unmute. Okay. I don't think Jim's going to be here today. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Mike Gallagher. Yes, I'm here. Where are you calling from? Uh, Richland, Michigan. All right, thank you. Uh, Pat Stetskevitz. Yeah, I'm here. I'm calling from Grand Haven. Thank you. Jim Johnson. John Yelich. Core Repository, Kalamazoo, Michigan. Thank you. Brian Eggers. I am in beautiful uh, Trevor. Did you say Traverse City? All right, yeah. All right. <laughs> Thanks for that. You blacked out for a second. Brian Burroughs. Present in um, DeWitt, Michigan. All right, thank you. Uh, I'm here uh, calling in from East Lansing, Michigan. Scott DeBow. I think Scott's not going to join, but this is Rachel Proctor from Jackson, Michigan in his place. Thank, thank you, Rachel. Uh, Buddy Sebastian. I'm here from the big town of Springport, Michigan. <laughs> Thanks, Buddy. Jason Walther. 
I'm here from uh, Three Rivers, Michigan. Thank you. Kyle Rora. And Tom Frazier. Uh, here from Hazlitt, Michigan. All right, thank you very much. OK, so let's see. I've also got uh, Bob Otwell. I've got uh, Clyde Dugan uh, in with Pat. I've got uh, Dave Grieco. I've got Christopher Gothberg, Grant Poole, Ralph Hefner, Joel Henry. Uh, I've got Kelly Turner, Kristen Poley, Andy LeBaron, David Lush, Mark Seaman, Mike Frederick, Mike Gallagher, Jim Milne, uh, James Ostrowski. Uh, I've got Nathaniel Schuff, Taylor Ritterbush, Victoria Velting. And I've got one phone number here. If you can please identify yourself, uh, the number ending in 42. Uh, yeah, this is Scott DeBeau from Consumers Energy. I'm calling from near Standish, Michigan. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. Laura, um, this is Abby Eaton. You, you missed me. So I'm calling for MDARD. And I'm thank you, Lansing. Abby. Appreciate that. <laughs> I apologize for missing you. Is there anybody else that I missed? I did not call your name or that you haven't acknowledged that you're here. Laura, it's Emily Hi. Finnell from the Office of the Great Lakes. I'm also Emily? here calling in from Okemos. Thank you. Anybody totally else? It's Christine Spitzley from Mason. Thank you, Christine. Hannah Arnett with Eagle from East Lansing. Thank you. Is, do we have everybody that uh, that has logged on? All right, hearing none. Um, what I'm going to ask for next is uh, unless it is, I'm going to ask for uh, approval of the agenda. And essentially, if there's anything that you would like to change with the agenda, uh, now is your opportunity to do so. And and uh, I, going off the example of our of our last meeting, if there if there's no objection, we'll just consider the agenda approved. I will point out that uh, that there is a repetition in in the agenda that uh, that we're going to correct. So you'll notice that item number six process and timeline for completing the legislative report and item number eight process and timeline for completing the legislative report are, are repetitions of each other. We're going to skip that one in number six and we're going to work on process and timeline uh, as agenda item number eight. Any other changes, corrections, or additions anyone would like to make to the agenda today? I am seeing and hearing none. And uh, and folks with Eagle, if you can let me know if there's anything that uh, that shows up in the chat or folks who are unable to to get themselves unmuted quickly enough, I'd, I appreciate the help on that. Um, I'm going to do the same procedure with asking for any changes or anything that you need to have corrected for the minutes from our September meeting. <coughs> and I am hearing none there, so I'm going to I'm going to consider those uh, the the agenda for today and the minutes from our last meeting in September to be approved and we'll move forward with those with the amendment that we're not going to do the process and timeline for the legislative report twice. Um, now is the time that uh, if anybody wants to make any public comment about agenda items, this is your opportunity to do so. We'll also have open comments at the end for anything that's not related to the agenda or anything that comes up during the discussion. So you'll have another opportunity, but anything anybody would like to bring up now. Again, you'll you need to unmute yourself if you want to if you want to make that comment. Okay, 
I am seeing none there. So like as I said, we're going to skip past this uh, this first process and timeline since we're going to be covering that later and we're going to jump right into some recommendations. I am going to turn uh, I'm going to turn the control over now to uh, my co chair Brian Eggers to run this next portion of the meeting. Thanks, Brian. Laura, John you, Laura. I, oops, sorry, I'm hearing some folks asking questions. Yes, John, John Yelich, I tried to use the chat just to oh. see if it worked and it's not working for me. Anybody okay. else? Have a sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I just happened to do it to ask a question without interrupting and it can't do it. <laughs> All right, thanks for thanks for pointing that out, John. So you had a question? Uh, no, it was just to check the chat to see if it worked and it didn't. That's all. Oh. Is anybody having <laughs> a problem? Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Good to note then. So, uh, so if you do have a question, um, it looks like uh, looks like chat might not be working for some folks. Although I do see that there's a couple of a couple of people who have put in test chats and they seem to be working. So, if if you're not able to to uh, uh, to get your question answered or or if we've skipped past, you let us know. You know there is a raise hand function uh, as a part of this meeting. Um, and though we, though we do all want to try to give each other a chance to talk, if you absolutely can't get in, just go ahead and speak up because we want to make sure that uh, that your comments get heard and that questions get heard and that, and that we address everything that that needs to happen. Um, and since this is a since we are going by Open Meetings Act, we do want to kind of minimize questions through the chat. Um, we'll we'll repeat anything that shows up there, um, but uh, but do try to make sure and let yourself be. Let yourself be recognized if you've got questions or concerns. So is there anything else that we've got to cover before we turn over to uh, to start the next portion of our meeting? All right, hearing none, turning it over to you, Brian, thanks. All right, thank you very much, Laura. Um, lot of recommendation for further discussion. I was unable to be here um, for our September meeting, so I'm, I'm going to try my best not to inhibit uh, and go backwards here. Uh, for We will start it off through the Michigan Hydrologic and Brian, I'm apologize. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you, but it, it sounds to me at least like you're breaking up pretty badly. You might need, I, much as I hate to ask you to do it, you might need to turn off your video to improve your bandwidth. Dave Hamilton, are you present? I am here I'm, and ready. Um, so we have the uh, Michigan Hydrologic Framework. Yes, thank you. Next slide is uh, coming up. Um, OK, so the Michigan Hydrologic Framework last time uh, when we went through it, there was um, a question or two raised uh, mainly about uh, geologic expertise. So we had a models committee meeting and we talked about it there. John Yelich wasn't able to be on that meeting, so I talked with him separately. Uh, the main issue of uh, recognizing geologic expertise is, uh, is recognized. It's important both in collecting and interpreting geologic data in Michigan and that we intend to use this expertise in developing the Michigan Hydrologic Framework. So I just wanted to put it there, make sure everybody sees and knows that. Uh, another thing that we uh, talked about uh, is in the meta modeling. Earlier, we had made that a separate uh, recommendation uh, based on input um, at the uh, uh, models committee meeting. We decided to actually make a part of developing the Michigan Hydrologic Framework. Uh, it was set up to go there. Um, or independent could go either way. Uh, making a part of the Michigan hydrologic framework is a little cleaner because then I'll be, uh, as we're developing uh, some of the models, we can incorporate meta modeling with that development and kind of kill two birds with one stone and um, see if we can go ahead and find a way to evaluate uh, incorporating information from calibrated models into the screening tool. Uh, the last thing that I wanted to touch on is that uh, we've looked at the budget a little bit more on the Michigan Hydrologic Framework. The total, when we bring in the uh, meta modeling, it's uh, $2.1 million over three years. And this should be front loaded a little bit. It didn't make it into the uh, current draft, but it should be 900,000 for the first year, 700,000 for the second year, and 500,000 
for the third year. So if we can get that change in the, uh, in the draft, that would be helpful. So any questions on this? <coughs> Laura? Thanks, Dave. Um, just wanted to, to confirm based off of the discussions that we had had, and thank you for having that follow up uh, with the models committee. So the meta modeling process, um, you know, it talks about here, this is going to be evaluated as a possible way to incorporate the information. This is something that's not just going to run back through kind of the uh, the committee that's that's developing the hydrologic framework that's actually going to come back to the water use advisory council right yeah thank you for for asking that um one of the things that we put into it is that we want to make sure that uh, this is not you know it goes on does not go on autopilot that um if it looks like there's something that could be used to incorporate information and therefore change the um the tool uh, that would that would come back to the council um, it would not just automatically go. What this would do is the evaluation would, would proceed, but if uh, we find that it looks like this is a, um, a viable way to go, that would come back to the council for further discussion before it could ever be implemented. Any other questions? That's all I had at this point, Brian. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, we've got without question. Uh, next up, uh, monitoring well network. Brian, before we move on, um, how do how would you prefer to proceed on kind of looking for for these recommendations that that had more discussion on them? Do you want to kind of take them one at a time or do you want to present them all and then go back through them and, and look for that consensus? Well, I think I'd rather, but I, again, I wasn't here a lot. I don't know what would be easier. Can you hear me, Laura? Yeah, uh, yep, I, I, you were breaking up a little bit when, when you were first talking and I can hear you again now. Um, I, what we had done what we had done before was we we had kind of gone through gone through all of them and then gone back through them to look for consensus but since this is kind of more of a and, and that's because they were all kind of grouped together that you know all the the recommendations were kind of linked but but since these are kind of more isolated they were they were just ones that were pulled back for specific discussion I wonder if it might be better for us to take um, to take consensus on these as they come up rather than uh, rather than to, to try to run through all of them and then go back through all of them. It might be easier to, to construct the minutes and, and to follow what's happening if, if we sort of dis dispense with these one at a time, unless there's objection. I, 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 guys, I have a very poor signal up here in uh, Traverse City and I'm, I'm really having a tough time um, capturing all of it myself on this on Laura. So. I'd rather see us take them one on, one at a time. And I'm assuming that if we're not having questions or dialogue, that that we have consensus. So I guess that would be the opportunity for if there's still significant concern, if there are you know if there if there's additional things that that would prevent us from reaching a, a consensus on this proposal. Now's the time to speak. We, as John right. Gillett, uh, we still have our committees uh, to finalize all of this, so that's when we, if there is anything we can committees. And I guess, Laura, this is Doug Needham. What what is the meaning of consensus? Is it the meaning that this is going to move forward? Is this this isn't ranking? This isn't prioritizing? This is just what? Correct. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Doug, for bringing that up. So reaching consensus on this proposal means it is going to go into the report. We haven't gotten to any discussion yet on ranking, prioritization, any of that stuff that's going to come afterwards as we're talking about constructing the report. This is just 
These recommendations were pulled back for more discussion because we we, we had uh, you know some folks with questions and concerns. So now we are looking for consensus to them to be in, for them to be included as part of our report to the legislature uh, that's going to be submitted in December. I am not hearing comment. I'm not seeing chats or raised hands. Uh, and Eagle staff, again, if you can help me out, make sure and if I if there's anything that we're missing. Um, I know Brian's kind of having trouble with his connection, so I don't mean to be stepping in here and stepping on his toes. I just want to make sure we're still able to to continue with the discussion. Yeah, Brian, this is Bud. Go ahead, can buddy. Can you hear me, Laura? Yes, I sure can. Um, I, I think we're closer than we were last time as far as my constituents, Michigan Groundwater, uh, with Dave's proposal, but I don't think we're there yet. I'm not comfortable going forward with this yet. So um, I'll speak up. Okay, I would like to say that we've had a meeting on this. We've had separate conversations on this. Uh, if there's something that hasn't been on the table, I don't know what that is. And I think we need to uh, push this forward. I can tell you that in the past when uh, we have had recommendations where we've had uh, generally folks, you know, and again, consensus is not necessarily enthusiastic. Uh, enthusiastic approval. It's I can live with this moving forward as a recommendation when we've had most folks who are pretty comfortable with it, but uh, but maybe one or two folks who still, you know, who still have concerns and questions that what we ha how we have handled it before and uh, and that would be a, 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 you know, a decision that this council could make new or could continue the, the previous precedent uh, is we have gone ahead and made the recommendation and given the ability for those those people who are uncomfortable to write what's essentially um, I don't want to call it a minority report, but it's a you know, but it's a it's an answer or a or a letter of concern or, or you know, or an addendum to the report that can talk specifically about what concerns you have with a with a pr particular proposal. Um, so I think what you know, what I'd be looking for is uh, so either some agreement or some thoughts about does this recommendation move forward with the ability of, of people who are uncomfortable with it if we've just got one or two to you know to be able to write a response to that that will go as an addendum on the report john i see your hands up yes yeah, sorry um i was sitting on a drill rig for seven working days so i didn't get a chance to write my report um uh, i did finally get it in on monday and it wasn't read until today so that's why i interjected before that we still need to resolve some things particularly about validated data and what's going to be used and how it's going to be used Okay. It is Dave. John. Sorry, Brian, did you ask me something? I, I said, is Dave aware of the particulars, John? So, we, so yes. we can help move forward. Okay. Yes, he, he received them, but he was gone all week. Like I said, I didn't get a chance to write them till now, and so I got them in. Yeah, John gave me uh, a list of things, which are basically things that he's talked about all along, that he wants geologists involved in things. He um, wants uh, data to be verified and, uh, and so on. Uh, in general terms, there's no dispute over that. Uh, John does raise questions about data sets that other people have used. Um, uh, I think that there can be discussion about whether data set is appropriate or not at the appropriate time. It really has nothing to do with whether we go forward with this uh, framework or not, but there will be a process to um, uh, decide which data sets come in. There will be a process to decide which models will come in. Um, those are things that need to be done as we build this uh, framework and as we create the databases and, and other work that we're proposing to do uh, from this part of this council. So those kinds of things um, are a bit early 
for for this, but uh, certainly things that we can talk about at the appropriate times. So, John, yeah, I, I you need to ask yourself: Is can you live with that, not knowing that there will be going forward? The quick answer is yes on valid data. The long answer is going to be. If we don't use valid data, we're going to be in the same position we are now with the Watt tool. Everything is not validated data that we have to deal with every day. That's the reason I said it. And I think we would all agree with that, John. So that's all I'm saying is that we need to have validated data whenever it's used. Can, can I comment on this? This is Buddy. Um, I, I, I think the idea of the hydrogen the framework as a whole is great and i'll say this one more time to this committee or this council excuse me ultimately other than the user of the water the people that are regulated under anything this council does is my group period we're the well drillers we're the ones that are regulated uh to to the standards that we all come up with my concern is data, valid data, unvalidated data, good data, bad data, whatever happens, my fear is it's, it's just another tool to regulate my industry. That's why I have concerns. Um, now, I do like the fact that going forward, we're going to have more committee meetings and we can iron some of this stuff out. We just have to be careful, okay? Uh, the picture has to be clear of what's going to happen once this thing is up and running. Is it just for reference or is it for regulation? That's my concern. That's why I brought up the concern. Thanks. I, I think that's, that's a good fair, question. Buddy. That's, yeah, I think that's a good question that uh, asked. You articulated it well. And I think it's also very clear that there is nothing in this framework that would have any kind of regulatory authority at all without going through the legislature or, or the legal process. This is uh, meant to facilitate the creation of models. Models are needed to interpret the data and to uh, make it usable for uh, decisions, um, but it, it in itself um, has no regulatory authority. Thanks, Dave. Brian, not to interject here, but Doug Needham's had his hand up for a while. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, Doug. so just, and I guess that's what goes back to my, uh, the original question, what are we approving here? This is a $2.1 million ask, 700 million, or 700,000 year one, 900, 700, and then 500,000. Um, we have a page and a half write up of what this is. I would, and that's where I guess I'm assuming as we move forward with it, the concept that we are embracing here is an estimated cost for the concept, but the intricate details as to how this is going to be laid out, I would assume it's going to be more than just a page and a half of what the ask is as we develop and want to spend $2.1 million of taxpayers' money. So that's where I guess I'm wondering, is this a yes, we agree with the concept, and we want it to be in the legislative report as something we want to work on, or this is something we don't want to, and we will work out the details later. That's kind of my thought. Doug, yeah, Doug. I'll, I'll, I'll accept the blame for that, uh, for, for that write-up being a page and a half, because what Dave Hamilton gave me was 18 pages long. <laughs> Right. Right. Okay. Well, and, and and figuring that that was going to be a full half of the report, I, I I selectively edited it down to the key points. Perfect. All right. Thank and, you. Yep. And, and Doug, it was provided to the entire council. I'll be glad to send you another copy if you like. It does include a work plan that shows the details of what will be done in the budget. Um, um, so it's it's it is ready for prime time. Okay, so really then what we are looking at is all of those 18 pages and those are the intricate details. So when Buddy uh, or John has an issue, they are just looking for those comments to be addressed in the full scope of things and how those are gonna be worked on. Yeah, what they're looking for is that um, there's a team has to be put together to oversee the development of this. 
And so what John's asked for is to make sure that there's a glacial geologist that's part of that team. Uh, decisions will have to be made on particular data sets and, and so on, uh, and models and how models are gonna be verified and put into, uh, into the process. That level of detail is gonna be worked out as the system is built, but there will be a team that'll be put together to uh, work on that. Brian, looks like Jim Milne has his hand up as well. Yeah, I am not seeing that on my screen. I cannot see that, Laura, so please tell me when that occurs. Uh, Will do. Something's in my weakness here. I also see that um, uh, uh, Brian may also have his hand up. So, uh, Jim? Well, if Brian Burrell still has a question, let him go first. Okay. Brian? Uh, Thank, thank you, you guys are kind. I just, I, I guess I just wanted to comment um, that, you know, I, I, this is, this has been in the process for a while. This was maybe one of our first recommendations that the council heard about uh, when it first got going after, I think on our second, third meeting. Um, you know, I, I understand that this is a tool for us moving forward to hopefully develop better things in the future, but, but it's not a it is not the development of a new regulatory tool. It is just a tool to help us move forward. Um, and from a process standpoint, I, I was just going to say that I, th I think we do need for official record keeping just to make sure that we we kind of get the uh, support and the objections kind of down for our meeting minutes. Because because this is a, the second call on this. There has been efforts made, and uh, I think for record keeping and moving it forward, we got to probably do that. So sorry, yes. Brian. Are you asking for are are you asking for an additional record or um, discussion or or people well, stating specifically I, they have objections or what what are you asking for? Yeah. So I I think so. This is the second reading of this one. Efforts were made in between the last meeting and this one. Um, I know we're trying to get a discussion that may be relevant, but as when we wrap up, I I do think we need to make sure that it's clear that. Um, all in support say so, and, and then any objections are noted uh, just for record keeping purposes on each of these. Well, I think it's fair to say, um, based on what I'm hearing, is that um, for the most part, we have consensus here with, with uh, a couple of footnotes from Buddy and, and John. Um, that that we can include in the minutes. Um, this is this is Jim Mill. I did have a follow up question to ask, Buddy, and secondarily Dave Hamilton. Um, Buddy, would it help address some of your concerns and smooth the path forward if Michigan Groundwater Association was represent had representation? on future meetings to the Miles Committee to work on the hydrologic framework? I, I have been included in the last couple. And yes, it will help. And I think as long as, I'll say it this way, as long as we're moving forward with a, we want to take a look at what's there, kind of an attitude. Uh, if this is the way I can explain it. Take this hydro, hydrologic framework and use it as a, okay, here's what we think we have so far. And if it's a growing tool, meaning we can change the data, add new data, take out bad data, um, I think in the report, I'm good with it. But if it's gonna stand alone, here it is, we're done, that, I, I have a problem with it. Does that help? And, and Buddy, just to answer that, this is not something that just um, will become static. It is something that will be growing with new data all the time. It's built into it uh, ways to create, to accept and use new data. It'll be uh, developing new models all the time. So it's really a way to, to facilitate a data collection and model creation. I like that, and I also do like the the idea of we need a glacial geologist on 
you know, at these meetings and um, as it's developed. Great. Sounds like we're there. Right. Brian, Brian, Brian John also has his his hand up. Just just to confirm yes, uh, what yeah. just just what we've just concluded is yes, as long as we're, we're taking valid data and putting valid data in where we can use it, that's what I heard and that's what I believe we should have in the text and I hope that it's there when we read it. That's all. I think it's all good. I I think one thing we need to be careful of is that when John uses the word valid data, he means that he believes it for whatever reason, whatever he's basing it on. And I think we need to be careful with that, that I would agree with the statement validated too, but I find that John, um, uh, he has some data sets that other people have used that he would uh, argue with. Well, that's fine. He can argue with that, but it doesn't mean that it's invalid data. It doesn't mean there aren't uses that are legitimate for those data sets. And I have a problem if we're going to uh, be excluding data sets and useful data uh, because John Yellich says it's not good enough. My last comment, if I can. Go ahead. We can, we, we can show that the data doesn't work. If we show that it doesn't work, we shouldn't use it. And John, I agree. There should be no invalid data at all. Um, but um, again, we're going to have to be careful about this, and, and I've got no problems talking about it as we're talking about data sets. All right, well, I think we made progress there, team. Uh, Brian, uh, Chris Alexander has her hand up. Chris, go ahead. Thanks, Brian. I just want to make sure for record keeping for notes that we're we are getting this down correctly because it's it, Christine and I and Jim kind of have to put all this together. So is it fair to say that we now have agreement from Buddy and John Yelich to move forward? This is Buddy. Yelich here, yes. Okay. Yes. Buddy? Okay. Thanks so much. You're welcome. I also see a question in the chat from uh, Victoria asking, how is data validated? Uh, for the purposes right now, I'll, I'll, I'll just say that um, validated can be a lot of things. Um, for every different type of data, there's a different, there's, you know, can be lots of different ways to validate. And, um, Moving forward, I can see that the the data committee in the future will will continue to take that up. We we did have discussions. There is a recommendation for ongoing work that's part of the report from the data committee that talks about um, digging into the great depths of um, data requirements and preferences. So, validated. Um, I think um, for guests on the on the call, we, we've been using that in terms probably of of a particular type of data. Um, that has some known issues and correcting those, um, but for in general, it can mean a lot of different things. Thank you, Brian. Any other questions before we move on to the next? Any are we have we covered this enough? I'm good. Great. Monitoring well network is up next. OK, just turned on my camera there. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, again, this is Ralph Hefner from the US Geological Survey. Um, just like Dave Hamilton and the uh, uh, hydrologic framework uh, work, I've got a longer proposal, too, that I uh, tried to uh, cut down uh, in order to put in this recommendation. Uh, and after uh, the conversations that we had at the last meeting, I tried to revise the text in the uh, the write up uh, to make sure that it was clear that, uh, again, we'd start with a four task approach of initial value evaluation of kind of the objectives behind the entire network, uh, putting a, a stakeholder group together, then evaluate wells that are available to us, existing wells that we didn't have to do, uh, anything to other than perhaps rehab and make sure that they were in good hydrologic or hydrogeologic or hydraulic connection to the aquifer. 
uh, start implementing the network. And I think there was a little bit of confusion there because there was some questions over whether the budget was sufficient. And our, our proposal uh, is kind of a, a stepwise approach where we would propose to put in 10 wells or add 10 wells per year uh, until the uh, optimum number of wells. And again, uh, just off the top of our head, we, we said uh, perhaps two wells per county. So that would put a total uh, network size of between 160 and 170 wells by the time we're done. And then operation and maintenance. So we continue to uh, QA those wells and make sure the data that we're getting them from them is uh, reasonable within the USGS tolerances, and typically that's within four one hundredths of a foot. So uh, I'm not sure what other, uh, you know, speaking on the data validation level that uh, you were all talking about with the previous discussion, uh, you know, our QA processes and procedures should hopefully take care of that validation and again fall in line with the rest of the national network. Um, there was also a question about how we could involve uh, the public uh, in this. And um, at this point within this proposal, uh, there was no uh, concrete way to do that because originally we were talking about uh, uh, drinking water wells and we, we stepped away from that because of the, the local uh, uh, county health departments would not uh, uh, feel favorable about that. So if we just go for observation wells, that is the only use for those wells is water levels and or perhaps taking a water quality sample to evaluate water quality in that area. There is no drinking water use of water coming out of that well. Um, our budget numbers uh, have stayed the same since last time. Again, I reviewed those and looked through those and they, they still seem uh, pretty reasonable. And um, then the final part of this is to join the National Groundwater Monitoring Network. Again, a network that collects information from various sources throughout the United States. And again, all we would have to do is work with the, uh, the network itself to develop that translator to be able to put uh, not only USGS data, which hopefully it would take uh, very well, but other sources of data into that data network and make them available to uh, all taxpayers, whether in Michigan or elsewhere. So uh, with that, I did not prepare a slide for this, but uh, hopefully I addressed the questions that came up as a result of our last meeting. And uh, again, I'd be happy to entertain any questions now. Does anybody have any questions for Ralph? Hey, Ralph, Ralph, this is Buddy. I had to step away. You were yeah. talking about local health departments and water wells. I, uh, can you repeat that? I, I just caught the last part of it. I'm sorry. Sure. Uh, you know, originally in our proposal, we had uh, put together an, an idea that uh, local uh, homeowners that had a well on their property would be able to remove the cap and put down a measuring tape and measure the well and report them through some sort of app. We have uh, apps available on handheld devices such as cell phones, but also computers or even call in or uh, submit a postcard to that. Uh, there was some uh, discussion that the county health departments would not want a homeowner taking the cap off their well and putting a tape down there, especially knowing that there might not be adequate decontamination procedures between those measurements. So we, we've taken that part out of the proposal and we would focus only on observation wells that are absolutely dedicated towards measuring water levels and not for uh, obtaining drinking water. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Anybody have any uh, any issues or, or trying to support this? Not hearing any objections, Ralph. I think we have consensus here. Christine, for the record. Thank you. And uh, if there are any follow up questions, uh, again, uh, I believe you have my email or uh, uh, chat or whatever the, the com communication. I'm always willing to, to talk about it and uh, steps forward. Thanks again. Thank you, Ralph. Next up. Dr. David Lush, Models Committee recommendations. Thanks, Brian. Can we move to the next slide, please? Thank, thank you. This is the uh, um, result of additional discussion on the compiling key aquifer property uh, recommendation. Whoop, back up one. Thank you. 
Um, this deals with uh, two items. Uh, redoing the statewide um, map of transmissivity, which is used as one of the base layers in the water withdrawal assessment tool, and then also implementing a GIS um, strategy to identify water management areas that have, that are dominated rather by uh, unconfined glacial aquifer systems and um, changing the storage coefficient for that water management area uh, in the um, tool. This proposal is after the uh, um, discussion has changed. So its budget is now $110,000 across two fiscal years. It has four components to it. Uh, Eagle staff will compile all available irrigation aquifer test data. Like we heard, there's uh, scores of these uh, aquifer tests that have been done in the Cass County study, for example. Uh, so Eagle will compile all of those wherever they are uh, and make them available to the external contractor. The uh, contractor, after going through the process, will have $15,000 to compile the statewide estimate of transmissivity for both glacial and bedrock aquifers, and we'll go through the GIS uh, protocol to identify those water management areas that are dominated by unconfined glacial aquifer conditions. The EAGLE program will have $10,000 allocated to it uh, to do an assessment, and this is what the new part of the proposal is, they will do an assessment of what these changes, uh, what the impact of these changes are on all registered and permitted large quantity withdrawals in the water management areas uh, that were changed, that had changed storage coefficients uh, and potentially transmissivities, and they will report those results to the council. Uh, they will also propose an implementation strategy for using the updated uh, transmissivity and storage coefficient values uh, to the council, and the council then will have to approve the implementation plan before any changes are actually made to the water withdrawal assessment tool. So as we heard in previous discussions, this is not a, a one and done. This is a do some work and come back to the council for final approval to implement changes to the water withdrawal assessment tool. And then the largest component of this budget is $85,000 uh, to go toward uh, CSS over at DTMB to actually make the software changes to the tool, but that would not be done until the implementation plan was approved by the council. Any questions on this one? Any questions or object objections on this? Part so, of it? John Yelich has his hand yeah. up and yes. Buddy Sebastian. John? OK, just to, to compliment Dave, because I'm looking at the slide presentation, not to what's on my screen in front, but we are looking at testing Cass and Calhoun County, where MGS, the Geologic Survey, has nearly completed Cass, but we have completed Calhoun, so that we have both surficial as well as subsurface geology mapped, as well as depth to bedrock. So that's, that's another proposal. That, that's true, John, but that's the next proposal. This one is the, the aquifer properties, which is only the storage coefficient and transmissivities. OK, well, then the numbers are wrong. I apologize. Because OK. And did Buddy have a comment? My, my question was, you were talking about transmissivity. Just one question. Were you going to, you said you're going to upgrade the watt after the transmissivity or input it. Is, are you talking about clay layers also 
That's just a question. The way the transmissivity values are computed, um, we utilize a technique to um, derive the effective hydraulic conductivity for the um, screened for the whole drill section of the, the well. If it's a drift well, it'll go from the bottom of the screen to the water table for that assessment um, as an example. So yes, clay layers are included in computing the hydraulic conductivity and then transmissivity is that hydraulic conductivity times the aquifer thickness. Correct, okay. So I heard you right, you're gonna update the transmissivity. Okay, all right, thank you. Yep. I, I'm good with this. Good. Anybody else? All right, not hearing any other objections, I think on this component, um, we have consensus as well, Christine, for the record. Dave, next up, 3D Glacial. Yeah, we can go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So this one was also uh, brought back for additional discussion and has changed. The original proposal was to um, map four counties. The new revised uh, recommendation is to do only two counties, Cass and Calhoun. And as John Yelich was saying just a moment ago, the reason for choosing those are um, that those are counties that are rich in um, recently derived uh, mapping data. And in the case of Cass County, of course, we have the Cass County um, project that has been ongoing and that has resulted in a, uh, a model. Um, so this is an $80,000 uh, proposal to uh, utilize a geostatistical approach uh, that is well grounded in theory and use, used a lot in the petroleum industry as an example, uh, but also in hydrogeology. It's called transition probability Markov um, analysis. And we used it in the Ottawa County um, study. And I felt that it did a nice job of um, interpreting the heterogeneity in three dimensions uh, that is exhibited in the lithology data from uh, water well records. So as you see, uh, the contractor, the, 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 the new uh, components are two counties instead of four. Cass and Calhoun are the two new the two counties. And the second uh, change here is that the contractor will propose and conduct one or more statistical comparisons between this um, transition probability derived geologic model uh, in comparison to a subjectively derived geologic model um, for each of those two counties, and then they will present those findings to the models committee. So this is not making a change to any of the um, current um, program elements. This is an investigation that could lead us to a new way of going about doing um, preparatory work in target counties in preparation for full-blown uh, uh, groundwater flow modeling. So any questions on this one? And I know this stuff is a little complicated, so I've got a follow-on slide here that's pictorial if you could go to that next slide. Dave, John Yelich here. I just want to concur with what you just said. Thanks, John. Can we get that next slide up, please? It's up, Dave. I think you're just, your computer's just having a lag, but the pictures are up. The oh, 3D okay. glacial aquifer mapping. Yeah, I'm not seeing them on my computer, huh? Nor am I on mine. There we go. Okay. 
So this is data from the Ottawa County study, the green and gray one, the, the triplet in the uh, on the left hand slide shows this is a true three dimensional well, modeling environment. I like to liken it to Lego blocks uh, where each Lego block in the model is representative of one chunk of the um, earth material in that locale. And then the, the colorful diagram in the lower right is a cross section through this geologic model. I changed the colors of the materials to show the, the cyan or bluish ones are the um, aquifer materials. The orangish red ones are the confining materials. So you, you can better see the Lego blocks uh, that make up this model. Um, but it's truly a three dimensional model. Every place inside the modeling domain will have a block of some size, uh, usually 500 meters square or smaller and four meters thick or thinner. Uh, so it's very detailed. And uh, you end up then with a complete um, estimation of the um, aquifer material types. The, the next step, of course, is to parameterize those materials in terms of what hydraulic conductivities should be assigned. Uh, and that's a, a separate step. But this, this replaces the subjective uh, way of going about coming up with the geologic model, which is the first thing you do in building a groundwater flow model. So any questions? Yeah, this is Frank Edowagishik. Uh, I just uh, wanted to clarify, I, I, my understanding is that the source of the data for this are the, is the water well records, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. And again, uh, the reason we chose the two counties of Cass and Calhoun, they either have already been updated or they will be updated in terms of the John's group at the Geological Survey going through and um, verifying the uh, locations. So this project won't go until we have verified location data on the water wells. Okay. Just uh, to echo Frank's uh, statement, and yes, that's correct, just as Dave just said, that uh, we have the ability to process the well logic logs and to put them in the correct location because what we have noted, and that's the reason that we're doing it, is that the well locations are anywhere to a mile to a township off in many cases. And so that's what we would do before we do this. And the last thing is, is that it's a comparison between the real geologic information and the interpreted one from the well logs themselves. So that's the reason the well locations are so important to have in place. So any any questions or objections to this by anyone? David, I believe we have consensus for the record. Christine. OK, thank Dave, you. Thank you very much. Next up on our agenda is the Water Conservation and Efficiency Group, and I think Kelly Turner is going to lead this discussion. Yes, thanks, you guys. Uh, the next couple of questions are really more policy focused than they are numbers focused. So give your brains maybe a little bit of a rest from the stuff that we just went through. Um, uh, I'm going to leave my video off if that's all right with you guys, just because my Wi-Fi is not the best here. And I think it's more important for you to hear and to see what we're sharing than it is for you to see me. So uh, go ahead, Laura, we'll to the next slide. So the Water Conservation and Efficiency Group really came up with two different recommendations that we're going to take a look at today. Um, we went back to the drawing board several times on all of these as we had more and more conversations with stakeholders and with uh, the organizations that would actually be carrying out these recommendations. Uh, given those conversations with the 
implementing organizations. Uh, we finally came up with these recommendations we're going to go over today. So next slide, please. All right, so we're going to start with the advancing Michigan's water conservation and efficiency efforts through state climate, energy and water infrastructure initiatives. So for those of you who don't have whiplash yet and have been able to keep up with all the executive orders and executive directives, um, you might recall that uh, Governor Whitmer recently um, put through uh, Executive Order 182 and Directive Number 10, which officially um, implemented the My Healthy Climate Plan which is a, a comprehensive plan that's meant to protect public health and the environment while also helping to develop the clean energy jobs by making Michigan fully carbon neutral by 2050. And the creation of this plan really provides an opportunity for us to bring water squarely into the energy conversation. We feel it, it's been lacking for a little while. In addition, the state's uh, My Clean Water Plan is investing $50 million into Michigan's aging water infrastructure, particularly in those disadvantaged communities, which uh, presents an opportunity to improve drinking and wastewater infrastructure, uh, expand green infrastructure, address water loss through leaky systems, and to educate the public about water and energy efficiency and conservation. So these initiatives, along with EGLE's new organizational structure, uh, including which includes the environment, Great Lakes and energy, uh, presents an opportunity to create a greater focus on advancing Michigan's water conservation. Sorry, 500 million. Thank you for correcting me. What did I say? Something obviously wrong. <laughs> Thanks for the correction. Yes, 500 million dollars. So. Uh, it really provides a, an opportunity for greater focus on advancing water conservation and efficiency goals and objectives under the Great Lakes Compact through strategic, strategic integration into Michigan's, Michigan's goals to achieve this carbon neutral footprint by 2050 uh, to address climate change, increase energy efficiency, improve aging infrastructure, and uh, as well as protecting the environment and public health. So that's a lot to take in. Uh, we also had conversations uh, really about new technological advances that have occurred over the last few years within the various water uh, user sectors that should be considered uh, when we take a look at water as a whole and conservation because it really can provide insight into potential water, energy, and infrastructure savings for all of those different water groups. So we really felt that Michigan should be more intentional in utilizing the existing and the new climate, energy and water infrastructure programs and initiatives that are out there to help achieve the conservation goals and objectives uh, to, to ensure that users have the best available information, tools and the latest technologies to engage in the uh, in activities that can improve the efficiency and water conservation resources and ensure sustainable water resources. So therefore, uh, we have these three uh, kind of bullet points that are on your screen. So we feel that Michigan should identify gaps and opportunities to strategically integrate water conservation and efficiency into the current and future uh, policies based on climate, energy and water. Uh, we should develop knowledge of best practices and cutting edge technological innovations for conservation and efficiency for the different water user groups that are out there. So including residential, agricultural, commercial, institutional and industrial user groups. In addition, we'd like to identify programs to promote education and outreach and technical assistance to the different sectors that I just mentioned. If you can go one more slide to the next slide. That brings us to our recommendations. So her recommended action really includes quite a bit of um, bullet points here, but we really feel that um, we the wa water use advisory committee should create a subcommittee that's made up of multiple stakeholders. 
um, to strategically integrate these water conservation and efficiency programs into our current climate and energy infrastructure policies and programs. So we feel that um, we should conduct an assessment first of this of the state of Michigan's current climate energy and sustainable sustainability and water infrastructure policies uh, and programs to identify the current and future opportunities where water conservation and efficiency efforts could be incorporated. We also need to identify uh, gaps and opportunities to strategically integrate water conservation and efficiency into future policy programs. Uh, we need to identify technological advancements that can be incorporated into these practices. And we'd like to assess the EPA's water sense program in other water rich states. So very similar to Michigan, what sort of conservation and efficiency programs, including education and that they are currently using, which targets major water user sectors. And lastly, uh, identify specific innovative opportunities to improve Michigan's uh, water conservation and efficiency program by building connections between current and new policies and programs, the technological innovations that we spoke about, and to really be able to promote education and outreach to all the different user sectors. So I know that was a lot in one little bit. And the next slide, I believe, goes through the costs, the funding. So our, uh, I really have to hand this to Emily uh, Finnell because she did a lot of background work on this. And we, she believes uh, with all of her work that uh, it would cost approximately $50,000 to issue a competitive funding opportunity uh, grant to hire a consultant that would conduct this assessment that we laid out and provide all of that information. So um, we would have to submit a project proposal through the University of Michigan Graham Sustainability Institute, uh, the Dow Sustainability Fellows Program. With that newly created subcommittee under the WUAC, um, Eagle and MDARD would convene a stakeholder group to develop more of this ongoing funding opportunity and to serve as advisors to the Dow Sustainability Fellows Master Project um, and then participate in the discussion that comes out of that. In the time frame, uh, given Emily's expertise and past um, efforts in very similar efforts is believed to be about 12 months. So before we move to the next one, do we want to talk, take questions on this one? Emily had her Thank hand you. up, Brian. Emily, welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. That was a great overview. I just wanted to clarify um, with regard to the cost and the funding, um, there's two different pathways. Um, they're not the same pathway. So one um, option that we were considering as a committee would be to issue the competitive funding opportunity um, to put out a bid request to hire a, a consultant to actually um, do the assessment. Another option that we're looking at right now um, and we've proposed um, is to submit a project proposal to the University of Michigan's Graham Sustainability Dow Fellows Program. Um, so they're particularly interested in climate and energy um, and, and doing work um, related to social equity. So there's there's kind of two different options there. So we're um, we're currently having conversations with the University of Michigan about um, a potential project proposal that some master students could work on um, starting in 2021. So I just wanted to add that uh, clarity. Thanks. Emily, Thanks, while you Emily. while you're while you're talking about that, can, uh, and I and I apologize if I'm not understanding this very well. So, it, is the is the request for one of those paths having that competitive funding opportunity and, and hiring this consultant is this something that would be a legislative ask that you need the that you need the amount of money in order to be able to conduct the search for a consultant or is it maybe i'm not understanding it very well so that's a good question um so yeah the ask 
would be for fifty thousand um, dollars to fund the assessment for a consultant to do the work, um, and we're also looking at some other ways to do this kind of an assessment. And another option that doesn't require funding would be um, pursuing this uh, Dow Sustainability Fellows Program. Uh, but in that situation, you know, it depends on what students um, apply to the Dow Fellows program, what their backgrounds are, whether or not you're going to get a match, you know, there's not a guarantee there. So, um, so we're looking at both options. So the, the funding asked for the legislative piece would be for $50,000 um, to issue a competitive RFP. Does that answer your question? Uh, it does in part, and just a quick follow up then. So, it, so there's anticipated there's going to be additional cost for Pay, you know, if you if you go the route of, of having a consultant instead of being able to to get the timing of of uh, of having the sustainability fellows program involvement, that you'd probably need additional funding to pay the consultant. Correct. Correct. The Dow Sustainability Fellows Program they actually pay a dollar stipend for each student um, that participates, so it's highly competitive. And Eagle and some of the other state agencies. Um, have partnered with them to do a variety of projects. Just given the lateness of you know us kind of coming up with this recommendation, we haven't been able to um, fully fl flesh out all the details of what the project would look like. So we're we're um, kind of focusing on this general recommendation of um, conducting the assessment. Okay, Brian, you've got a couple of questions from Dave Lush, Brian Burrows, and John Yelich. All right, who, who is first? So Emily, this is Dave Lush. Just to clarify a question that Laura, you answered for Laura, the $50,000 um, request is to hire a consultant to do the assessment. So that's the cost of doing the assessment, correct? Yes. Thank you. Emily, this, this is Brian, Emily, um, and, and Kelly. Um, what, what was your co committee or groups thinking about the timelines? Um, and I know I'm going to maybe put you on the spot, but, um, you know, if it takes a certain amount of time to acquire the money and then to do the work, does are, are we worried that the that some of these other initiatives kind of set sail? Do we feel like we can get the, the assessment done and then have a good, strong ability to factor in some of our you know, our water conservation desires here into those, or do the ships, you know, start sailing immediately and by the time we catch up, it's too late? Um, if I understand your question, it's a, a timing issue of, of, you know, the number of these executive orders and uh, directives have been issued recently, and there's work that's starting, you know, now to start to form the council and membership, and then they're going to start doing their work. So I think if I understand your question, it's, kind of about um, if this project would be done, you know, at the end of next year, is it going to miss the window of time to inform some of this new work that's being done right now with the My Clean Water Plan and the um, My Climate Plan? Is that correct? Do I yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm, I've i seen before when, you know, new programs get going and then, you know, somebody tries to, you know, say, hey, 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 you missed this and can you build this in? Sometimes you just miss that window of opportunity and, you know, those programs don't want to kind of turn around and build something else in. So that's kind of what I'm trying to gauge is if it takes, you know, 12, 16 months to, you know, to do this, are we going to be too late to get people to to build this stuff in to those? So, um, so I can speak to that. So I've already been having some ongoing conversations over the last month with Brandy Brown, who's the climate and energy advisor, and Robert Jackson, who um, runs the energy and sustainability programs in Eagle, um, to start to try to connect these dots. Because I see a, a real opportunity now for us to make sure that you know water and water con conservation efficiency are kind of brought into some of this current work that we're doing. And I've been kind of seeing it over the last couple of years where you know the sustainability section and units and Eagle are doing um, work with businesses and they're they're accomplishing some of the water conservation efficiency work, but we're not necessarily intentionally and directly tying it into the way we're thinking about Michigan's water conservation efficiency program. So I would say that um, I'm already working to try to help make some of those connections now and having those conversations. Um, and we're going to be 
setting up some further discussion about what does the water piece look like in the water group that informs the climate council. Um, so some of those conversations are happening right now um, and also talking about uh, with them what are some ways that we can better connect water conservation efficiency into their current programs now or what are they already doing that maybe you know some of us are just not aware of because we haven't had the energy programs in Eagle and work directly with them. So we're having those conversations now. I don't think that the assessment, it would be too late. Obviously, if it's a competitive bid process, I think 12 months is longer than what would necessarily be needed. It depends on how comprehensive you're going to be um, in that work. If it's the Dow Sustainability Fellows pathway, you know their projects are a 12-month time period. So they start in January to February, and they, com they complete all their projects by the end of the calendar year. So I think our goal was to try to bring some capacity to start to really look at these opportunities for these synergies for water creation efficiency to the climate, energy, sustainability, and water infrastructure programs now. Um, and any additional capacity we can get to help us move that needle and do that work is going to be really important. Um, so I don't think we're going to be waiting until the, you know, December of next year to say, okay, you know, climate report came out, where's water in there? You know, we're, we're working on trying to make sure that it's incorporated in the conversation. Thank you. Thanks. Kelly and the rest of the team is John Yelich. Uh, I want to compliment you. This is a, a great, great, uh, summary that you just gave. Uh, just very quick background is that my belief is is that there are too many Michiganders, and I use that as a broad term, uh, don't believe that we have a water shortage. And uh, where we've got growth, where we've got PFAS, where we have the other things that are impacting our water, people don't understand. And you also talked about the infrastructure and what it's done. Having worked in the Southwest US uh, on many, many projects where people do have to conserve water uh, and Pat Stack Havish is aware of this. Ottawa County is looking at conservation in this area, and it really should be a model for what we should be looking at statewide because mm. our groundwater, particularly those people that don't have a straw to the lake, uh, is really their water source, and it's not uniform in volume and quality, quality everywhere. And so this is where this is a, a great program, and we need to make sure that we incorporate, and it looks like you have, incorporate the fact that the people of Michigan need to understand just because we are underwater today, we were not underwater in 2012 and that was just what eight years ago. And so they need to understand that we need to be conserving our water, particularly where we've got growth and many of the areas that are growing right now, quote unquote, are the ones that really have a limited amount of water to use. So um, my hat's off to you. This is a, a great program. We just need to make sure to use that some of the work that uh, Ottawa County has been using as some of the examples. Thank you. Brian, Doug Needham's got his hand up. Doug. All right, and I want to go back to I'm still I'm I'm still stuck on what is the fifty thousand dollars? The assessment is that to do a full water conservation and efficiency study, or is that just to hire to to figure out what it should be included in an RFP in order to hire somebody to do that? Emily, I'll let you go ahead and answer that since you have your hand up. Okay, um, that's a good question, Doug. So I, what, what we were envisioning is that the funding would be used to look at our current programs within the state. So look at our current water infrastructure programs and where we're making investments now with things like the My Clean Water Plan in projects like green infrastructure and where we're um, looking at asset management planning and doing data collection and where we're looking at things like um, infrastructure improvements to see where um, where we could more um, intentionally tie in water conservation and efficiency um, goals and objectives and practices. So it's to look at our existing programs and our policies that we have at the state level and how we're implementing those assess where where is water conservation efficiency woven in already if it is and if it isn't are there places where it could be more strategically um, and intentionally incorporated so you know if the state starts working on things like water you know leak programs 
Um, that's helping us accomplish our water conservation goals and objectives under the compact. Um, but, you know, from our water infrastructure programs perspective, they may not be um, implementing that program or thinking about it in terms of the Great Lakes Compact and our, you know, Michigan Water Conservation Efficiency Program. So, I mean, that's just one example. So, it, it's looking at our state programs and policies that we currently have and identifying from both climate, um, energy, sustainability um, and our water infrastructure programs to see where does water conservation fit within those? Um, how could it be more um, strategically integrated into that work? And, um, you know, what would it take to ultimately make some of those changes? And where is there some low-hanging fruit? And then where, you know, some areas that we could have a greater impact? So it's not the, the $50,000 isn't to develop the, um, you know, request for proposals to inform the development of that. It's actually to kind of look across all the programs to see how do we really better tie in water conservation efficiency and efficiency into the existing programs and policies that we have. Okay, thank you. Abby Eaton's got her hand up. Uh, yeah, and I would add that it's not looking at just what's going on within the state. It's also surveying other what we would classify as water rich states that have been implementing programs related to conservation and efficiency and seeing how that might also apply to Michigan. Thanks, Abby. Anybody else have any questions of Kelly or Emily? Any objections? Uh, Doug Needham has his hand up. Doug? So I guess just to go, is is this one that would we be putting in our report or is this one that should jump out maybe a little bit ahead of that um, in order for things to get moving a little quicker? Both. Well, I guess that would be up to this committee, like the... <laughs> I know except like this is the first time through this, so like I am a little unsure of the processes and if they would accept something sooner, um, you know, in, outside of the whole report that we're sending. So I guess I would leave it up to this committee as to um, the time frame you would plan on um, sending this to the legislators. I think uh, I have Emily because um, a lot of education to her and uh, a lot of support information and she's uh, working behind the scenes to build the the relationship you know, pull together pieces of information that would uh dovetail into this recommendation. So I I would say in a way uh, she hasn't waited, which but then I'm sure we're following back up and supporting her with this you know, report. So I just, uh, I, Kelly, I'm sorry, we're, your phone was, um, your connection was breaking in and out. Um, I just want to add that, uh, like Kelly said, I'm, I'm having some of these conversations already. It is a question I have for this council. Uh, when does it make sense for us to move forward and expand the committee to include um, some of these other key stakeholders. So um, I have a commitment from our energy and sustainability programs that they would like to participate in the committee, the future committee, or, you know, at whatever time we decide we need to bring them in and start working with them. Um, I would assume it would make sense to do that now, but I would defer to this council on, you know, when do we take that step um, so that we can start to look at where those program integrations can occur. Emily, I would suggest that, or team, I guess I would suggest that if we have consensus here, and it sounds like we do, that that we should, you know, make that very clear, make that official right now, and and uh, charge forward on this. Any objections to that? No objections here, and 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 I would say I I agree, I agree with that. Um, for 
and we'll talk about the, about this a little bit more with the with the timing and and completion of the report. But really, when we when we're talking about presenting this to the legislature, as a lot of you know, uh, budgets have to be approved by September first. So when we have a, an obligation to have this report done by December really what's effectively going to happen is we're going to submit the report by the end of December, but it's not going to be really considered by the legislators until the following late winter, early spring, whatever your concept of that time is. Uh, you know, once the once the legislators who have been elected have found their desks uh, and are ready to have somebody come in and talk about stuff that's going to be a potentially part of the next fiscal year budget. So all of this stuff that is in this report you know, unless the legislature feels really strongly that they need to, you know, present some kind of budget supplemental to to get stuff going right away. Um, it, you know, the effective timeline of this is that it gets implemented with the with the fiscal year 22 budget that starts uh, October 1st, 2021. And and Eagle staff and especially James, if I if I've misspoken with that, please do correct me. But otherwise, that's that's my understanding. Pat, you've got your hand up. Um, I generally support this uh, proposal. I guess my my comment was that, um, you know, given the scope is right now a little bit evolving, I'm not sure if 50,000 is enough, but your your discussion of the timeline um, kind of lends itself to, you know, more work on the committee level to maybe uh, focus in exactly um, what would be required of the consultant. So I'm comfortable going ahead, but I think I think we need to let the committee do a little bit more work and 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 uh, g get some more clarity to that um, proposal. Emily, you had your hand up as well, so I don't know if you or Kelly want to respond to that. I just wanted to respond that given that timeline, um, I think it would allow us at the committee level to expand um, the participants and bring some of these um, representatives from the other areas that we want to look at water infrastructure, sustainability and energy and climate into this discussion. And that will really help us focus um, a more targeted RFP um, given the timing would be next budget cycle. Um, and. I think there's some greater value there to let the committee continue to do its work, um, bring those other voices to the table. So we would be in a much better position, obviously by the beginning of October of next year to have a, a real specific targeted RFP on what we would want that assessment to look like. Frank, you have your hand up. Yes. Uh you know, the, we're looking at the, the 50,000 option in this, but if the other option is it comes to, comes to pass with the Dow Sustainability Fellows Program, uh, it, it seems that that may be something that might happen at, a, at an earlier timetable. And so, you know, that uh, I think that that's still up in the air. I, I support this. I've, you know, I've been part of the, following these discussions and everything through all this. And I, I think it's a it's a really important thing for us to be uh, be looking at this, this whole issue of climate. But I do wanted to I did want to point out that there's one track would be starting with that next fiscal year's funding. Uh, and then one of them could happen at an earlier time period. Thank you. Thank you, Frank. <clears throat> I additionally just want to make sure that it's that it's noted that it's since it appears in the chat, um, Buddy Sebastian said this is great work and it needs to go out ahead of the report. Uh, this is this is Brian Burroughs. I just want to make sure I definitely understand the pieces to this and, and we're, we're uh, responsive to stuff. So um i'm hearing correct me if i'm wrong that one piece that people want and and we should take care of now is sort of uh i guess consensus or a motion to create a, a standing water conservation committee within the uh, wuac and to make sure that um you know the officer or the committee coordinators of that feel empowered to invite um whoever they need to participate in that and that that should be done ahead of um is that 
Does that first piece sound right to this group? That sounds like what I'm hearing, Brian. So I'm glad that you circled around. So I was like, okay, where are we actually at with this? Um, I, I would open it up to the other folks to make sure we're all on the same page. Any objections, team? Okay. All right. It sounds like we do have consensus for the record here. Okay. So we got the committee, the new committee created, and um, I, you know, maybe maybe we can fill in the blanks, make sure that we. <laughs> The, the name and the record is whatever the group wants to be called. And, um, you know, we'll have to find co-chairs and other things. But getting back to the, the money piece, um, given the, you know, there, there could, in relation to us getting our report out, we have a $50,000 estimate. Maybe it needs to be more, but in really to refine it, you're talking about waiting until after the report. That, that would have consequences of us not going with the 50 in the report. We can put the 50 in the report and hey, maybe we get good news and you don't need it, right? Because uh, the proposal goes through with the other program, but should we be, for the purpose of being right at the brink of this report, should we be approving this $50,000 recommendation to go into this report now? I see Emily's trying to chime in. I'm gonna leave my, I'm trying. <laughs> Put my hand up and down. I'm waving to the group. Um, I uh, what I think we should do is pull out the um, submittal of the project proposal and just maybe we can include that uh, for the Dow Sustainability Fellows Program either in the narrative or we leave it off for the purposes of this report um, because we are that timeline um, would be earlier than um, I think the report will be submitted to the legislature. So that's going to go through, you know, in December um, and the details we're working out internally on what that project proposal is going to look like. Um, so we could maybe include it in the narrative and just say this is something the departments are already going to be working on that will further inform the competitive funding opportunity. I don't know about the dollar amount if, you know, what the will of the group is as far as increasing that. Um, I'll defer to this group. Oops. Is my hand down? There. So what I'm hearing is that we would the council would create this new subcommittee. The subcommittee could start working right away on looking at the, the fellows program and other ways to get the work started. Um, but then if this $50,000 is what's in question in the information to go into the report, uh, we're open to, uh, you know, amending right now if someone has suggestions, but, you know, we may get lucky, like you said, Brian, and we may not need it if the, if the Dow Fellows Program uh, goes through. That sounds Correct from my interpretation. I guess what what I would add in is just the 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 question or the caution that if this proposal pulls out and does not include a funding request, and suppose I, I mean you know yes we want this to 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 be. Uh, you know, granted through the Dow Sustainability Fellows Program, that would be awesome. But if it's not, and we don't have a legislative funding request in the report, does that put you guys back to not being able to timely do this kind of assessment while this other really important work is going on at the state level through the uh, my clean water plan or what, you know, and all the other things that are, that are going on in the, in the energy and climate and, and water sphere. I, I don't, I don't want for this group to then be stymied by not having the ability to get that consultant on board to do that assessment um, because the, you know, the, the request for funding to get that started is not included. That, that would be my my question, my caution. I, I'm a little leery of, you know, just saying, hey, we're just gonna we're just gonna roll all our eggs into the basket of hoping that that the sustainability fellows thing goes through. 
Laura, I wasn't um, proposing that we pull out that ask in, in our uh, recommendation. I guess my question to the group was, uh, are you comfortable with $50,000 or should that be a bigger ask? Okay. Sounds like we folks are comfortable with that. Confused everyone. Um, That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, to keep this moving, uh, I'm going to ask uh, another time here. Are there any objections to this now, as it's understood? Can I can I confirm that what we understand is one? There was a new committee created. And that's been approved. And then the second thing is that this newly created committee can start working immediately. And that the third thing is to approve these recommendations with the $50,000 request. That is correct, Christine. That's my understanding. Okay, thank you. I'm hearing hands up. I can't see them though. Uh, no, nobody's raising their hand. I think that was somebody's background noise. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. I believe we have consensus there for the record. All right. Hey, we can Emily, move on to Emily, the next one. <laughs> yeah. Thank you both. And uh, go ahead, Kelly. All right. Next slide really uh, focuses on increasing water efficiency and conservation practices in the agriculture industry. So um, before anybody gets irritated right away with me on this one. So part of the background with this was taking a look at previous recommendations and there were a lot of recommendations uh, around agriculture irrigation. And so as we dug in, uh, we realized that there's been a lot of work that's been done uh, in this sector, but in order to continue uh, on the great work that's been done, that's kind of where we pick this up a little bit. So um, sustainability of water resources is definitely important for the future of agriculture. It's indisputable. Uh, the ag sector has experienced uh, expansion of new with water withdrawals um, basically since the initiation of the registration requirement in Michigan law. Uh, there's also been an increasing trend in irrigated acres since the 1960s, which results in increased production uh, on ag products on ag lands. So with improved technology, uh, it's also allowed the increased irrigation efficiency. So a new state policy focused on achieving a carbon neutral footprint by 2050, which we already talked about, uh, we figure presents opportunities to further integrate energy and efficiency practices um, that are tied directly to water conservation uh, and efficiency for use in agriculture and agribusiness. Uh, water conservation and efficiency practices are expected to increase in importance to major water sectors and these these may be uh, part of the solutions that are used by the water user committees in which uh, we have another group that's talking about when it comes to developing realistically shared solutions to sustainably managing water uh, in those agricultural areas that are experiencing some turmoil. So based on water use trends and the prominence of ag irrigation, water conservation and efficiency practices may play a larger role in water management and the potential use of these water user committee actions. Uh, the Michigan Commission of Ag and Rural Development has um, developed through research comprehensive guidance in the form of uh, GAMPs, which are generally accepted agricultural management practices for uh, specifically for irrigation use, uh, which includes a guidance for proper irrigation system management and water resource stewardship. So the irrigation gaps really are a tool that can start the education process about water efficiency and conservation and helps uh, those educators to start those conversations uh, into deeper practices with additional tools and programs though that are needed to assist 
the ag industry to holistically uh, be able to optimize its water efficiency. So um, optimizing efficient use of water within the ag industry may also provide water quality benefits by reducing nutrient loss. So I think the next slide, if we can move forward, is our recommendation. Yep. So our recommendation is uh, to that that we really place additional focus on conservation and efficiency education and training in the ag industry. And this was specifically after conversations held with uh, Dr. Ron Bates, Marilyn Thalen, and Lyndon Kelly, uh, who Lyndon Kelly is the current MSU ag irrigators educator, and he's split between MSU and Purdue. So after conversations with them, they really felt that there needs to be more emphasis placed on uh, education. So um, lost my spot. So in order to accomplish this, uh, we suggest that MDARD Eagle and the Michigan State University Extension, uh, specifically Lyndon and Kelly's group, should develop and implement a strategy with clear objectives to expand training and outreach to each ag industry sector to improve water efficiency and where possible provide water quality benefits. Uh, this new initiative should include a systematic approach to water efficiency in conservation education and training for both plant and animal agricultural industries that then can tr transition into a long term institutionalized program. I think if you move to the next slide, uh, this really talks about our cost funding. So after discussing what a program would look like and what they would need at MSU Extension to provide um, a, a program like this, they uh, it came down to the addition of two full time educator positions um, to add to the current MSU irrigation educator team, which right now consists of one person to develop to develop. Then launch the initiative into a program that could be institutionalized for uh, a, a long for long term, but really it would take three a three year period to develop and get this um, program started. So estimates from MSU is that it is between 80 and 100 per person or per position annually. Um, and, and that what's ruled into that cost is salary, benefits in a small operating stipend for each of those individuals. So the ask is specifically uh, for $200,000 annually uh, over the next three years to develop and to launch this initiative. Um, the time frame, like I said, is three years to develop, initiate, implement, and evaluate the program. After this initial three-year period, then uh, we would expect that these positions would become institutionalized so that we can continue to see success on this front. Any questions? <laughs> Kelly, this is Laura. Um, it, does this does this request assume that Steve Miller's position isn't already in the works to be refilled now that he's retired? There was no discussion about that, Laura. Um, so that's a great question that we would probably have to follow up on. Um, right now, I think with the hiring freeze that MSU has in place, I don't think that counting on that position being filled. OK, thanks. Brian? Questions for Kelly. Yeah, this Brian is Burrows Brian. Brian has his hand up. Um, hey, so uh, thanks for indulging some questions. I'm, I'm very, very, very new to um, water irrigation efficiency uh, topic. So um, a, a bunch of general questions. Um, <clears throat> Where where generally is this now? So I'm, I'm trying to wrap my mind around what is the potential for water efficiency gains and what are the most predominant obstacles today? This, this seems to indicate education is it, but is it the cost to acquire, purchase, install, maintain? Um, I'm, I'm looking at, I guess, trying to figure out what is the um, 
is this the right lever and what's our potential value of this? Right, that's a great question. I appreciate that. We started off on a completely different path, actually, based off of previous recommendations. But as we got into conversations with the current educator who is uh, split between MSU and Purdue, they really said, you know, we are seeing great gains. Like, Agriculture understands the importance of this and uh, of following GAMPs, but it's really the education about efficiency. And so um, hands-on learning about how do you calibrate um, uh, irrigation systems? How are you doing tests? How do you know how much water is actually flowing through that irrigation system that you have out there? And that's where it, they need more people to do that education because it takes more time, it takes more energy, and it's really more hands-on than just sitting in a classroom or providing documents for people to read. Like these are very kinesthetic learners that are trying to um, figure out how to, it's like calibrating a sprayer or something. Like if you're not actually doing it in person, you can read it in a book all day long, doesn't make sense until you actually physically do it. So um, going out and helping people um, learn how to do that, work with their systems, work with their uh, irrigation equipment providers to help uh, move this initiative was where they felt there was a lot of um, a lot more work that needed to be done, especially in the different sectors. So fruit and vegetables and animal agriculture was high on their list. And Brian, that was why I'd asked the question about Steve Miller, because he did a lot of those educational programs uh, along with Lynn and Kelly out in the field. Uh, Doug and then Jason, I see you guys have your hands up. Hi, right, thanks. Not, not that I'm questioning the need for this, um, but you know, as we sit and we work to develop our full report um, and just looking at the asks that have been put out so far. If both of these, now you started off this presentation on both of them actually with the, we need to be carbon neutral by 2050. So is that the goal that all of these things, this and the water conservation efficiency of the previous ask for, for a consultant uh, to review and now this, is this to get us to that 2050 carbon neutral um, or is this just something that should be done right now anyway? And when I look at the full pots of money that, that we're looking at, I mean, again, we're not ranking, we're not looking at, at where this falls. It's just the idea, do we add this to the list? And if so, when it's at the list, where is that going to how, why should it rank maybe near the top? Um, and I think that goes to Brian's thing is, what is the return gonna get on it? So I, I rolled a bunch of questions in that one. <laughs> but they were great questions actually, Doug, I appreciate those. Um, I think as a group, we could talk all day long about what we could do to get us to that 2050 goal, uh, that carbon neutral footprint, right? And um, as long as we see like that's where the policy discussions are going, we just try to align with what things do we see that we could be doing and that need to be happening to move us in that direction. Is this going to get us all the way there? N no, <laughs> right? Uh, probably not. It's going to take a lot more than that to, to get us there. But um, this is definitely one place where there has been an ask and a need that's shown up and so um, we've got a lot of stakeholders that were kind of behind uh, moving this forward and really interested in like hey if we're going to be part of the solution here's where we need help so i don't know if that answers your question or not it it, it does it helps thank you jason uh, hey, I'd just like to uh, say to Kelly on the explanation and want to support. Um, we've just an example to provide. We see quite often when we, uh, you know, as a farmer and irrigator, when we go to calibrate a system, especially a system that hasn't been uh, calibrated in a long time, 
um, that a, a normal sized 120 to 130 acre uh, irrigation system that we in one annual year, uh, in or one annual year, one year can save uh, between 20 and 30 million gallons of water uh, when we uh, calibrate a, a system that has calibration issues. So, um, you know, those are quite often on the little bit higher side, but it's not uncommon at all. And uh, just one other uh, just comment, it, it is absolutely possible to reduce water use with education and training and focus. Uh, we've seen over the last decade uh, reduction of water use per unit uh, in excess of 30% um, across the different that we're farming. So I, I think it's uh, a great focus and it, it does pay off with education. Jason, that's good feedback. Thank you. Uh, I see Brian Burroughs has his hand up, and then after he goes, I have another question as well. Brian. <clears throat> um, yeah, I so I I like this, and um, I think I'm still just struggling, um, you know, a little bit to understand the program that would be developed and um you know how many people need to be reached in a given year two year cycle and how much can one fte reach out and do um you know I, I just not familiar with all of it not really sure versus you know one fte versus two and i know it proposed it's tough so it proposes to develop the program launch it and evaluate it um so i have like little questions about you know, you know what will the quirks of the program be how you know what will it look like when it's the how will, will it be evaluated so um i like it i'm just you know those are the little parts of not knowing quite enough to 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 totally be comfortable yet but um i like it yeah i totally understand brian and you are spot on uh so it was actually um was it when was it thursday Thursday afternoon last week when we finally got uh, the MSU stakeholders to the table where we were able to really explore this topic. So we have not had the time to dig in. Um, basically, this was kind of a, a little bit of a brainstorming session that we had with them, and there were a lot of ideas about what this could look like and what they could do. And so just based off of their experience with uh, what they've seen in other states and what Lyndon is able to accomplish right now, it was uh, their suggestion uh, to add to position. So I I'm I think we're all right in line with you that we really need to figure out more. How would this be done? Um, what does that look like? You know, and is that hundred thousand dollar ask too much? Should it really be eighty thousand dollars? I think we would need to figure out what those um, what we would include in the operating stipends for them to be able to hold in-person events. And so, um, yeah, this is nebulous and that's because we kind of just started scratching the surface on it. Um, I'm not sure, uh, Kelly or anybody else on, on the team, if you guys can answer this. And, and I wanted to make sure that to note again for, for minutes in the meeting, uh, Andy LeBaron had posted in the chat that uh, Dr. Yonsuk Dong was hired on with MSU Biosystems and Ag Engineering uh, before Steve Miller's retirement. And I do remember that he did that he did give a couple of presentations to the to the Irrigation GAMP Committee. Um, and Andy says, it's my understanding that he will be filling in the role left by Steve. Um, I guess my question is, uh, and I don't know if anybody uh, who's a part of this meeting can answer this. Maybe this is a Ron Bates question. Um, can an approval of funding by the legislature to uh, to create FTEs for MSU extension override MSU extensions statement that they're in a hiring freeze and they're not going to hire anybody? I mean, can we pick and choose and say, hey, for this program, we're we're giving you money. Go forth and hire the person. Or is there some procedure within MSU or state government or something else that would prevent us from being able to do that? That or is prevent a the legislature from doing that. <laughs> that is a spectacular question, Laura. I think you are right. I would have to circle back with Dr. Bates on that, but you know it is MSU, and so there are a lot of forms and procedures. So my 
I lean towards, sure, I bet there are. <laughs> I just don't know what they are at this point. Yeah, this is James. My understanding is all the state would ever do is add this as a grant to MSU. Um, it would be MSU's decision on whether or not to move forward with it. All right, it looks like Emily and then Pat have their hands up. Emily. Sorry, I agree with James um, that that's definitely a pathway that this funding could be moved forward um, if there were to be a hiring freeze. I just wanted to add um, to Kelly's um, overview of the project that you know we we were originally looking at um, advancing a recommendation tied to the irrigation camp, and Lyndon's feedback on that was that he really felt like the low hanging fruit had been accomplished over the past thirty years of educational work, and that focusing on um, some type of a, a new initiative that would be focused on efficient use of water um, among fruit, vegetable, field crop, dairy, and livestock educators for three years would really help improve skills and knowledge of both staff and producers. So that's kind of the um, information that led us to revise this recommendation um, and focus it more on both the plant and animal um, agricultural industry. So I just wanted to add, uh, add that comment as background. Thanks, Emily. Pat? Um, so I've got a question on um, metering in the in the agricultural um, sector, because when I've looked at the past, I thought a lot of the irrigators don't need to, to meter, and they're all estimated. And so we're talking about spending all this money on, on education. And I think, you know, we've talked about validated and real data. It seems like a water meter is is a simple way to get at real data from the irrigation, um, the big irrigator. So maybe my my information is wrong, but maybe Abby's probably the best one to speak to that. Is is metering required? No. Short answer, so and and you'll get a lot of pushback for it too. I I realize that, but so do municipal water supplies. But we, that's part of our part of doing business. You know, mm -hmm. we have to build it into our our costs and we've spent a lot of time talking about real data underneath our feet. Well, that you know, this this one seems to be pretty easy to get at. A water meter is a very very tried and tested technology and it's not that expensive. So, I'll get off my soapbox, but I would I would be more supportive of um, requiring metering and uh, rather than spending a lot of on, on education, but I, I this is a good a good proposal. So Pat, um, I, I don't want to speak on behalf of the entire GAMPS irrigation committee, but I sit on that committee. Um, and you know, one thing that that I think that we've acknowledged is, you know, number one that metering for water use, is, you know, is a smart way to go. Um, I agree with Abby's assessment that I think that there would be pushback to to require it. Um, you know, and I think that comes more so from maybe more so from the folks who are, who are a little less up to date on the technology that's coming to us from the drier parts of the country. So, you know, and that's and that's just kind of the way the technology has been flowing is, you know, something, you know, new methods of improving efficiency are developed in the areas where water is under the greatest stress uh, and then they kind of slowly filter this way. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of acknowledgement that, hey, there, you know, there's things that we can do. There's a, there's education that 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 we can provide, um, you know, and as it becomes feasible, as it, as it becomes something to say, hey, you know, this really should be, a, a, you know, a general practice here in Michigan. You know, we've we've tried to acknowledge that with the committee, uh, while at the same time kind of not going to the, uh, you know, to the ends of saying, hey, we should just be requiring this stuff across the board because it's it, it's not a great fit for everyone. And I see Buddy and Abby have their hands up. I can go. Um, water meters are expensive. I mean, for a meter that's accurate. Um, I would I would disagree with that statement that they're, that they're not expensive. Um, you are going to get a lot of pushback. I don't think 
any irrigator would have a problem putting a meter on once, validating what they have, take the meter, go to the next one, if something like that could be done. But I know that's expensive, too, and a lot of legwork. But uh, there's an easy way to do it if, if you know how to engineer your pump. But not every well driller and or irrigator knows how to figure that out. So uh, this is a good avenue to go down to figure out and get good, accurate numbers. But uh, meters are expensive. I've bought plenty of them. And I would add to that that, I mean, there there are a number of the new systems that are going in that are including meters to do this retroactively for uh, 10,000 pumps in the state. I don't know how you do that. Um, I don't think anybody would argue that meters wouldn't provide a better representation of what water use is in the state. It's just how do you get there, especially given um, the systems that are already out there without them. Uh, this is Brian, I, and uh, I was just going to say that, you know, again, not not knowing the program to be developed, um, you know, questions going through my head after hearing the last couple answers about meters and saying, you know, is is could the right answer be maybe one FTE, but a, a very large operating budget for them to drive around and to provide a bunch of meters? Because if you're going to really do hardcore evaluation of of a program you, you have to have your metrics and it, it can't just be you know number of people that you met with um you know maybe they need an operating budget to provide some you know some free flow meters kind of before you come in for training and then for a little while after and then switch them over to the next person um you know maybe that gets you to some of those evaluation metrics i don't know thanks see jason and then abby have their hands up jason Thanks, Laura. Just a, a comment as an irrigator in the Plains, uh, Kansas and Nebraska, we have lots of systems that of course have meters. Uh, meters help validate and confirm what we are pumping. Uh, definitely agree with that. However, I can't say that we use the meters to increase efficiencies and uh, reduce water use. The as you know, we look around the country and Michigan uh, for sure applies uh, equally uh, or maybe even more in many instances. There's a lot of examples that we see where we can improve technology of, of uh, delivering water from the system to the ground. Uh, the technologies that we have of their, for example, it's one that we're a big fan of is called an IWAB nozzle uh, that is is uh, up to 90% efficient in delivering water to the, um, you know, to the soil versus some other nozzles that can be uh, as low as 50%. So we see a lot of opportunity to improve, uh, you know, systems. And I think that when Kelly was making her presentation and following uh, Lyndon's recommendation, that that's probably what uh, Lyndon is referring to. Thank you. Yeah, and, and Jason actually brought up one of the points I was going to say is that uh, yeah, metering won't won't ans help you answer the efficiency question necessarily, um, and especially given the variables that are involved with weather and the different crops that are grown from year to year and those sorts of things. And so, how do you how do you base the comparisons from year to year with those being targets basically? But but metering from um, denoting uh, an accuracy in use, I mean, definitely you could say that that would improve, improve it from that standpoint. So, okay. Any more questions of Kelly? Um, this is Laura. I guess it, one addition. This isn't so much a question as a comment. Um, and and that is, you know, as we're kind of reviewing this proposal, um, knowing that uh, Kelly and Emily and and all of your team have talked with Lyndon Kelly about this, and that and that you're kind of following his recommendation on this, um, I'm I'm hesitant to go changing it around or to or to adjust 
you know, either what the FTE ask is or what the operating stipend is, um, just knowing that Lyndon Kelly has decades of experience uh, working with growers, working through the university system, um, I, I would tend to, you know, if this is the recommendation that he has made, uh, I would tend to trust that he's the probably the best person, at short, short of Steve Miller, who's, who's retired, uh, he is the best person to know what it is that they need and what, you know, what the costs of that are going to be and, and how to best implement that program. So just throwing that out there. And I would add that this this wasn't just Lyndon. It was Lyndon with Marilyn Thalen and Ron Bates. Yeah. Hey, Laura. Sorry, this is Tom. I forgot to raise my hand. Um, <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> the 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 one thing I guess I I would I and I'm not sure if this recommendation is ready for prime time. I'm not quite sure. I know that came up in the beginning of this of like. Is this something that we hold on to, or you know, how are we going to put this in the report? I I would like to give some consideration to um, needs need to give some kind of consideration to the fact that there are uh, ag irrigators that uh, still are not registered within the state, and, and the state has spent a lot of time and money and 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 resources um, around educating and trying to get people to that point um and and many still are not um so I, i'm hesitant about more money around education um without like solid metrics of how we're going to define successes of that I, i'm also a little bit concerned about kind of how this is getting tied to gamps as gamps as you know are a, are a voluntary program and and the voluntary program um that has a, a very specific kind of drive around limiting neighbor nuisance issues, right? So I'm, I'm, and those standards within GAMPS change every time or every year potentially. So I, I'd like to look at maybe opportunities to either mandate something in GAMPS around this. Um, I, I think we, we need to kind of tweak that language a little bit to give some more assurances that, um, this is actually that this money would actually deliver outcomes for the benefit of the water use program. Dave, you have your hand up. Dave Lush. Yeah, uh, just want to assure you, Tom, there's nothing that goes on in MSU extension these days that is not outcome verified and outcome evaluated. So, um, it's more difficult now to be an extension agent than ever in terms of performing um, uh, quality quantitative evaluation of impact to your programs. Uh, in fact, there's now a whole uh, multi-person section of extension that supports extension agents in doing just that, quantitative assessment of impact. Emily, you have your hand up. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Dave, for that comment as well. Uh, I just wanted to respond to Tom's comment and that, you know, this recommendation is not um, specifically limited to GAMPS. It's focused on being much broader than GAMPS and including the development and implementation of a strategy with clear objectives. Um, we did not include specific language regarding metrics because more discussion needs to ha happen around what that would look like and you know trying to be brief in these recommendations um but i think our full intention was that this was an outcome-based approach um that would have you know targeted strategies for um, each of the individual agricultural um, industries so uh, i just wanted to clarify that this is we we include in the background the acknowledgement of the irrigation gaps um, that has been a uh, you know, a historical recommendation from the Water Use Advisory Council. Um, so we were sort of trying to pay tribute to the importance of that irrigation camp. It was also in the Michigan Water Strategy. Uh, but this recommendation is intended to be, I think, much broader in its focus around education and outreach um, and very strategic uh, in its approach to um, working with the different agricultural industries. 
Thank you, Emily. I'm uh, I'm looking at my watch here, and we've still got a good chunk of the agenda to go. Um, I, I am hearing uh, kind of a general consensus with some issues yet on this. Um, what what are what are your thoughts, team? Do we have enough of a consensus to to move forward and support this? Doug, you have your uh, hand up. Yeah, I guess where where how I'm looking at this is I guess can if we just would add this to the mix um, of our of our ideas and recommendations. Um, again, this is going to kind of go all into that big report that we're working on. This is one of many things, but you, you know we haven't even started talking about ranking as a committee yet. And you know, is this one that would be higher or lower? You just think put it on the list. I think it should be considered on the list. Um, for something to look at moving forward, but I, you know, where it falls, I'm not sure. Thank you, Doug. I'm I'm in alignment with that thought process. Does anybody object to that? Brian right, like, Burrows, you have your hand up. Yeah, I I think you know what I'm trying for is um. I. I, for me, it's I think it's kind of I I feel a little bit like some of the other recommendations where we're kind of authorizing and saying we stand behind an investment um, and we don't have all the details. And in those cases, we've kind of built the water council or it or its subcommittees into the implementation of it, kind of like as a steering committee sort of involvement. Um, so I think for this one, you know, I, I can I can live with this. I, I think I just don't maybe have enough details to really, I guess, like personally define defend um, defend the details of it. So if if there was some way to do what we've done in other cases and, and kind of craft in a, you know, a slight modification where uh, the water council and or a subcommittee of it play some bit of a steering role in the development of it that might allay some of my uh, un uncertainties. Thank you, Brian. <clears throat> it sounds like um, there may be enough support here for us to move forward with that philosophy in mind, Brian. Um, I, I do think it needs a, a little more clarity. Um, James, I, I'm, uh, I think the jump to MSU uh, needs uh, some, uh, I don't know what it is. We're missing, a, we're missing a connection to MSU, I think, in in here that would be more direct and accountable. Yeah, I, I defer to Abby. She might have a little bit more experience on how state programs interact with MSU Extension. Um, all as I'm familiar with is, is something like this. It would be, you know, appropriated to the university unless it was a direct grant through a state department. Could be either way, but um, I'll defer to others. Again, that's way down the line anyway. Yeah. And I would say, yeah, I, I agree, James. That that would generally be how it how it would probably take place, but um, it could be done in a number of ways. So. so I'm uh, I, I'm in favor of moving this with uh, general consensus um, now to get it off our plate and get it headed in the right direction. I think uh, Kelly and Emily, you've got enough feedback to hear uh, some good suggestions that, that can help in, in uh, the refinement a little bit of this as we move it forward. Yeah, I have a lot of notes. <laughs> okay. Good, good feedback, good information, great questions. And with that, then, Christine, I would uh, mark uh, general consensus with notes um, 
to move forward. And I think it is time to hand the gavel over to Brian Burroughs. All right. Uh, I think with that, we should move on to item number eight, um, slash six, uh, which is process and timeline for uh, reporting. And if I looked ahead a little bit, I believe this looked like um, Laura and Doug were going to take the lead on um, spending some time here. Is that correct? Yeah, thanks, Brian. Um, we've got the, the implementation committee, uh, as you know, as, as a lot of you have seen uh, from the very, very rough draft report that has that has come out so far that's kind of cobbled together what we what we had received up to that point for uh, for recommendations and then had uh, had made some suggestions on an executive summary and introduction. And, and I want to thank everybody who uh, has submitted comments so far and, and has already made that report better. So thank you for that. But we wanted to make sure and bring up two topics today. Um, one of them is the uh, language in the introduction uh, that that refers to kind of our discussion topic from the dis from the September meeting in which we talked about wanting to make sure that the report reflects um, the you know the importance of, of water conservation and the importance of, of water to the state. And then the other one was to talk about a question uh, raised in some of the comments about that about that introduction about do we and how do we prioritize these recommendations? Uh, so Jim, if you don't mind going to the next slide. All right, so you don't have to read all this. This was in the introduction. I just repeated it up here so that we so that you knew what we were talking about. This is two paragraphs that uh, that our committee pulled from the 2014 Water Use Advisory Council report uh, in order to try to capture some of that some of that spirit of we want to make sure and emphasize that you know that that water is incredibly important to the Great Lakes, to this state, to this committee, um, and that you know, and that there is a very central reason why uh, this is a topic of discussion and why we're going to the legislature with a you know four million some dollar uh, ask for each year to be able to support these programs and to be able to support this research and and moving forward, as well as you know why we should continue to do this work and value water, uh, you know, in its state and as a resource. So uh, Jim, if you can move to the next slide there. Um, what my what our, our basic question was uh, to start with on this is do people are people satisfied with that as a statement or should there be a new statement be uh, should a new statement be crafted uh, to more appropriately reflect what this council's objectives are? Um, and you know, and if there needs to be something else, can you know, is there someone who feels like they are up to the task of of crafting a new statement to that? And and I guess somebody speak up if it would be helpful to go back a slide so that you can look over what the what that language is again. Yeah, uh, Laura, let's let's do back up one slide because okay. the silence that you're hearing is not associated with raised hands or chat boxes. Yeah. <laughs> So again, this is this is a statement that was that was pulled from uh, actually it was the conservation committee's section of the 2014 Water Use Advisory Council report. But we but we felt that it, that it was appropriate in catching capturing the conversation that we had at uh, at well at actually at both August and September's meeting uh, about hey we really need to this report and our council really needs to reflect the importance of the Great Lakes and and the importance of the of the work that that this council and all and that all water users and all, and all stakeholders have. And this language is in that draft that was sent out. So I mean, it sort, is. Of, sort of looking at it right now and reading it, it, it is nice to see it in the, I guess it's full um, state as it then flows into the next section. So um, I mean, I think right now is if you like it, great. If you don't, it would be great to have some feedback because I know we have sent that draft out for all to look at. Frank, you have your hand up. 
Yes, uh, I uh, uh, I like this. I think it's good. I think that it captures something. And I did have a play a hand in the writing of this <laughs> this particular statement, as you might imagine. And I think that it's a. I think it really sets a good tone for the overall what we're doing. And uh, while there's so a great deal of of technical uh, uh, material within this we need to have a philosophic point to sort of lead off. And that's why I, I, I think this is a good idea. Uh, I know you ask if there were any objections, but I, I'm not objecting. I'm, I'm uh, thinking it's a good idea and endorsing it. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. All right, John, John Yelich, you have your hand up, go ahead. I, I just want to comment and echo what Frank said is that um, I talked about this in my statement before about water and conservation. This does a better job than what I did. Thank you. Well, we'll thank Frank for it because I am aware that he was the he, that uh, that he had a, a ownership of the of this segment. <laughs> I think um, for just to, to give my opinion. Um, to add to it is, you know, so much of what we write about is very technical or le legal. We list out lots of statutes and years and dates and data and models. And um, I, I think um, hitting the importance in this way is um, is a very good counterbalance and will probably only do us some justice in grabbing some attention at the beginning of what could be a pretty dry report for people to, to read. So. Brian, you're talking like like you suggest that this stuff isn't interesting to everybody, yeah. and I'm just so hurt yeah. by that. Yeah. <laughs> it's our job to try to make it interesting. Um, yeah, but I, I I think it's good. Um, is is anybody else have any strong uh, opinions one way or another? I'm trying to scour here, looking if anybody else has a comment. Um, if we don't see one here in the next, oh, Tom Frazier, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think it's a, a very good uh, introduction in, in language. I just wonder, since it is taken from the 2014 report, if we should give some recognition to that oh, fact. Maybe say they... like with the 2014 report, so on and so forth. Just a, I... Just a thought. Yep. No, Tom, you you had an excellent observation, and that's the way the introduction is written. Is it acknowledges that this is from the 2014 report, and it is just as relevant today as when it was written in 2014, and is a and is a continuing you know priority and obligation of the council. And then uh, and then obviously with proper citations, so that people can go and read the 2014 report if they're so inclined. Okay. Great. Thanks. So Laura, I'm not seeing a lot of other hands in line for it. So what I would say is I think that you have, um, I think you have the support for that. And, and you know, um, the long shot is if, if as all council members are reviewing that draft and trying to send in their thoughts, if somebody has a suggestion for how they can improve on that, then, you know, perhaps send it, uh, send it our way, but it sounds like you have good support for it. All right, thanks everybody. Um, moving on to the next topic here. This is priority recommendations. Um, and again, this is this is something that was a that was a question that was brought up, and we wanted to bring it to the full council when the implementation committee reviewed kind of the, uh, the all the recommendations that were submitted uh, and understanding that we wanted to sort of collect them into logical progressions rather than this is the data committee, this is the models committee, this is this committee and that committee. Um, we sort of, we, we put the recommendations into four buckets and, and you can see what those are here on the screen um, that, that basically we've got recommendations to continue and improve current operations that's going on right now that needs to, that needs to continue and needs to, and, and needs to be improved. Recommendations for new operations, uh, again, to collect, to improve that data collection and modeling with the recommendations there. Uh, recommendations for additional activities to improve data collection and modeling as continued uh, and new operations are underway so that, you know, so this is stuff that, you know, as we're moving through the, through this progression, these are things that, you know, that need to get started. 
uh, and then new and ongoing activities that do not need additional state funding. So that's where all of your recommendations that that this group has made. And again, this was this was drawn up before we had the before we had the conservation recommendations in. So these are gonna those are gonna have to fit in somewhere. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, that kind of has the the gist of our questions. The implementation committee proposed that while the report should emphasize that all these recommendations are a priority to council, that you know that we have done this work, that uh, you know that each committee has you know has sort of selected the, the you know the items that are at the top of the list in terms of things that are you know that that need to get done and, and that need to get done first, that the groups as they're listed. Um, are prioritized in order of necessity for immediate, that is, you know, fiscal year 22 funding, uh, but that the individual recommendations within each group are not prioritized. They're presented as a package. Um, and that is our proposal to this committee. We wanted to get feedback on this, see if there is consensus on it. Uh, and additionally, now that we have these conservation recommendations that have been uh, that have been given consensus, where do they fit? in uh in that body of recommendations so that's the that's the discussion that we wanted to bring up for today's meeting all right dave hamilton has his hands up everybody else go ahead and click your buttons dave okay. yeah i'd like to um think about this prioritization again uh there is a logic with how these are grouped together and i will not uh, deny the logic because it, it makes sense but when i think of prioritization we tend to do it with the idea, well, if the legislature is only you, you have a sum, what do we want versus what are we willing to wait for another uh, chance at it? And when I look at it that way, I have a bit of more of a problem with this because when you look at the dollar amounts uh, in the first grouping, uh, there's really not much money involved in the second grouping. That's where almost all of the money is involved. There, and when you look at everything, there's like there's one very big proposal, there's one kind of medium-sized proposal, and all the rest are small, um, or relatively small. Um, so, you know, I'm not sure that I would want the legislature, with our encouragement, drawing the line in between one of these categories. As I look at them, I have a hard time distinguishing between the first and the second. And as I think about what this program needs, is that I would say that to improve this program, uh, we need to really push forward with data and modeling. And as I look at this, I think it's really hard for me to believe that here we are 12 years into this program. And when we talk about SSRs, we're still having arguments over what analytical model to use. And I, I'd like to give a little bit of perspective on that because um, analytical solutions were developed as a workaround because people didn't have computers. So when you go to the development of these equations, you go back into the 1800s, the early 1900s, the applications into hydrology in the early 1900s. Um, and, you know, we have plenty of computing power now. Numerical models started developing back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, the computing power that's developed in the course of the work that we've been doing in the last 15 years is phenomenal. So we have computing power to do an awful lot now we have models that are available, model codes that are available now to do an awful lot. So we can be doing a lot more. And certainly we need more data uh, to be able to do it effectively. So um, I think we need to push data collection um, as very top priorities. And um, I'm not sure that this kind of breakdown, if we uh, do it this way, really accomplishes that. Uh, it may be better not to try to say that there's this is a priority differentiation other than it's some logical differentiation. Well, just to kind of answer that, Dave, there there was there was that discussion of what is the what is currently being funded that we have been informed the funding is drying up for and go, will go away. And so those were kind of the OK, here is if we only get X, we at least want to continue what we're doing today. Now we want to improve. That's where the next tier comes into play. And then we want to build on what we've done. So there is a logic to that. But there was that discussion of if all of a sudden we didn't get anything or got very little, we at least want to continue at the same level we are today. And I guess what I'm saying is I really want to push for driving improvement. Uh, I think that should be our priority. Okay. 
And I don't disagree with what you just said, but I really want to drive for improvement. And and Dave, that is a very good point, and and I want to and I want to reemphasize that that is something that we want to make sure is made very clear, and and, and I you know and and want to do some some crafting to make sure is is clear, and I, uh, I especially want to point out to the you know thanks to those commenters who kind of asked about the prioritization question, uh, you know that we really want to make sure the legislature understands that all this stuff is really really important, and that you know and that we want to you know it needs to be done yesterday. Um, and and again, to to Doug's point, you know, if they say, okay, we're only going to give you this this amount of money, you know, at that point, then we've got to make the hard, which of your children do you love most, uh, decisions, and say, all right, do we keep the lights on, or you know, do we do we do new activities, and uh, and that's that's the point at which then that you know the order of the uh, of those recommendations comes into place to where we say yeah we got to keep the lights on at the very least you know the the monitoring that we have out there and that you know and the work that we are doing needs to continue and and i absolutely agree that doing new stuff is very very badly needed all right <clears throat> um back around this couple of times but um Buddy, I see Jim Milne is up next, but Buddy, you had your hand up and took it down. So put it back up if you do want to still ask something. Jim, why don't you go ahead for now? Okay, thanks, Brian. Just from the perspective of the water use program staff, I'm not sure where I would recommend putting the new conservation recommendations in, whether I would put them between the second and third dash bullet points on the current slide, or if it should go in between the third and fourth dash bullet point on the current slide. Historically, because of staffing limitations in the program, water conservation has not had a very big emphasis compared to data collection and the active administration of the program. Eagle has a lot more resources staffing and otherwise available to it we've got the office of climate or in energy whatever they're whatever they're called the office of the great lakes that the water use staff can collaborate with and maybe they can take a larger role on some of these conservation efforts but it would be uh if it was put on water use assessment unit this would be a big shift from the traditional focus. Thanks, Jim. I appreciate that thought. And 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 another possibility, obviously, too, is is rather than making those conservation pieces their own category, just to retitle one of these one of these buckets so that uh, so that the conservation piece fits in with it. So is so instead of making five buckets rather than four, you could still have four buckets, and then just one of them has conservation the the conservation recommendations in there. That's also a possibility. Um, Abby Eaton. So I was on the water water efficiency and conser conservation and efficiency work group in the 2014 um, round, and I guess part of my issue with um, what we're terming as prioritization is when we went through this exercise this time, we already had to prior reprioritize what our recommendations were from 2014 to get to this point. And the fact that we keep watering this down, what we can have a conversation on is where should this be assigned? Maybe under Jim's group is not the best place. And I would, would agree with that. But um, so we might want to look at who, who is going to implement some of these recommendations. But I do have a significant issue with this being sidelined because it's not important enough for this committee because it's not um, measuring or you know redoing models or that sort of thing. I know I know that Frank Rustwick would have significant problems with it because we spent a lot of time on these earlier. So I just have to put that in. It's just something that's been gnawing at me. Abby, Thank that's you. a good point, and 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 I agree, and that and. That's part of why I wanted to have that conversation as well as, you know, making sure that because I kind of, you know, I feel the same way you do. I, you know, I feel like conservation piece kind of got a little bit of the short shrift. Um, 
uh, from the previous recommendations, they were like, yeah, that's going to be in the Michigan water strategy. You know, you, don't worry about that part. Uh, and so I want to make sure that the, the, you know, that those conservation recommendations, uh, you know, now that they're, now that they've gotten that consensus, that they are a part of this and that they're included in, you know, hey, these are our top priorities. Um, so, so any, any help or suggestions that you guys have for making sure that, that those get that equal opportunity uh, would be very valued. All right, uh, I'm going to switch to Dave Lush, then then Kelly Turner. Uh, thanks. Um, I remain unconvinced of the necessity to prioritize recommendations. The legislature is going to do what they going to do, and your prioritization of these recommendations, in my opinion, will have little impact on their decision making. Secondly, to the intro of the whole report, it seems to me that the conservation recommendations deserve their own bucket and that it lead all four or five of them now. Thank you. <laughs> and thirdly, I think as Dave Hamilton was saying, if we get rid of the idea of prioritizations, then what we have are logical um, files, if you will, or, or folders to put recommendations in. And in that regard, I find that the recommendations for the water user, uh, the Watt tool user interface update and compiling key aquifer properties would belong in the first folder recommendations to continue to improve current operations since both of those recommendations which are currently down in the third group folder um, are actually designed to improve current operations thanks so so just on that response from the implementation standpoint in the committee when we started we had over 70 recommendations with zero prioritization and nothing got done for six years and so that was the focus where we went was okay how do we come up with a logical step in actually accomplishing something through this council and this is the proposal we put forward. It may not have, and we know it doesn't have everyone's recommendations from the 2014, because there were 70 of them. But what we did want to do is start biting that apple and start making progress so that every year, every couple of years, when we go back to the legislature, we have a path moving forward so that we can show we are making progress. Yeah, I would submit that the reason we didn't make progress in the previous council is because we weren't making direct recommendations to the legislature. That's a good point, Dave. Um, and, and I guess one of the things that I that I, I you know, I don't want to put our department folks on the spot, but, you know, with the report having kind of this pared down these are our favorite children uh, listings of things that we, you know that that each of these committees wants to get done first. What would be helpful and useful to you guys, um, as, you know, as the legislature is saying, okay, we've received this request for this funding. Um, you know, we're either going to. I mean, it's great if they give us all the money. If they don't, but you know, what then do does the department need for help to figure out? kind of what they're going to do with the amount of money that they do get. I will try <laughs> to, to take this one. Um, and part of it just gets into the weird world of budgets. OK, just so people understand, Eagle will have already submitted its budget to the administration prior to this report being done. So it won't officially be part of any of the Eagle requests for next year. This will kind of come in cold into the legislature asking to have it added into the state budget. So um, it will take a little massaging there to figure out, you know, wh who becomes champions of, of the recommendations that are within the report. Um, I have rarely seen appropriations without boilerplate providing direction. So I doubt they're going to give us 
you know, a million dollars and say, make the water withdrawal program better. Um, it's just not the way they usually operate. They will, they potentially will pick and choose among the list and the boilerplate language would, would articulate what they would like us to do with the money. So do I, so I guess from that, do I hear you saying that kind of kind of along Dave Lush's point of it doesn't matter what we prioritize on on this list we put this forward as hey these are the top priorities that we've got and then the legislature is going to make the decision yeah you know either we're going to give you you know these are the things we're going to give you money to do or we're going to give you money to do you know to do this this and this off of this list um I'll, I'll state the obvious to the extent that this group is in consensus on what its priorities are there is a better chance that the legislature would adopt those. Um, to the extent that there is not consensus, there is, you know, again, a chance that money will flow our way, but the more people they're hearing from, the more likely it is to happen. Um, okay, I'm gonna switch to, I don't see Kelly's hand up, so I will switch to Tom's and Nikki. Yeah, and thanks, Brian. And this, I think James hits on this a little bit. Um, I think the the way we prioritize them in the report, to me, is is only as valuable as when each of us individually or as an organization goes out there to talk to legislators that we are also presenting it as this is the priority and not going to them and saying, hey, here's this report, but you know, this recommendation is really important for my group or my constituents or whatever. And so I think that if I, I'm kind of agnostic about uh, prioritization and like what that looks like as long as it, but if the expectation is that based on the priority, based on the prioritization, that's also how we are advocating for these asks when we go to the legislature, um, that's more, I think, important in my mind to, to get a little bit better understanding from the group about how we're going to communicate to the legislature. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I would probably add to Tom's briefly too, and, and just say from the data committee, I mean, I know the need to prioritize, but we really did not um, all the way in the way that you might <laughs> really want. I mean, we, we tried to very practical we tried to talk about what was realistic and so what we're asking is you know it's a status quo for streams right and it's and it's a big you know it's actually it's not a giant jump in geology but the price tag's giant and and then groundwater it's a modest start um but we didn't really go through talking about like what had the greatest value proposition by dollar and what was in greater need and benefit to the program. I mean, we just didn't do that. I'm sure we probably all would have fought and left the table and not come to agreement on anything. But from, you know, from a real sensitivity analysis standpoint, like what data will, you know, return more result, we didn't do that. So we're not, I don't think that we would be too well prepared to really you know, move some of those up or down either. Uh, comfortable with the bins, but it would be hard to really to go further than that. Um, so I kind of appreciate that too. Um, I'm sorry, so I see Frank, Frank Adewagishik is waiting. Yeah, I, uh, you know, in this discussion of prioritization, I think it's, a, I think it's important for us uh, to uh, perhaps make a statement that that we have taken the work of the previous council and taken the what 70 recommendations i believe is the number and this what we've done for this council is to pri is to distill those into this this uh, into this this report into our report now and so rather than prioritizing one or the other with what we've got what we want to point out to the legislature is that to help guide them in their decision making, we have distilled these as all being important within the the approach that we're taking, and that uh, you know that this builds on the work of previous one previous uh, reports, but that we have we we went through that process of 
trying to pull out of all of those recommendations, the things that we want. And I think that we're gonna, we miss the boat if we don't tell them that we've already taken and done a, done a prioritization to come up with this smaller list of recommendations. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, as, as I believe Dave Lush said, they're gonna do what they're gonna do, okay? Uh, you know, I mean, but at least we need to let them know that we've taken, put the effort into bringing this down into more, a more manageable, uh, a more manageable ask in terms of dollars and a more manageable number of prior of of projects and recommendations. Thank you. Okay. Now, if uh, Frank, if I if I can respond back to that, and I appreciate that, but let's just say we do have, we, and I think what Laura reported on there is, let's say we had a four million dollar ask initially, and they say, great, here it is. Here's four million. Get it all done. Two years, come back and show us what you've done. With Eagle staff right now, is that something that we could immediately start working on every one of these tasks and have something yield a process or, or a result? Or is this something that we really should be walking into? And I guess that's where I really want to, you know, James, one of the questions that I had is how much money would we, should we expect to ask for? I mean, we can't get 30 million. We can't get a hundred million. Is four million too much? Is a hundred thousand realistic? Where do we sit? So those are all the things that we talked about. But then we did say, let's say it was Christmas and we got everything we wanted. We want to make sure we can deliver on it. I, I think James may remain silent because uh, uh, his crystal ball is glitching. Um, <laughs> but and i guess and i guess what when what i what i think i'm hearing from from the committee and and i'm comfortable with this is instead of trying to prioritize these recommendations because the legislature is going to do what they're going to do uh and they're either going to and they're either going to give us the whole bucket which would be wonderful uh but if they don't they're going to tell us what they want us to do and in, in which order that i'm comfortable with us uh kind of rewriting that that paragraph where we talk you know where we talk about hey these you know these recommendations are prioritized uh and just say you know these recommendations are the priority out of the pre you know the previous council's 70 recommendations you know this is the stuff that needs to get done now still keep keeping it in the buckets adding in a fifth bucket uh and putting it first because it should be first um uh, you know the talk the talk about the about the conservation group's recommendations and say this is what this is what we're proposing and uh, you know and refiguring the dollars on uh on what that's going to mean for the ask for the for the next couple of years so uh i would say i am comfortable with doing that hearing the feedback from the group and i appreciate everybody giving me that feedback all right, so given that, I am also seeing that we're down to 10 minutes with a couple more agenda items. So I have John Yelich and Dave Hamilton with your hands up. Um, you got about 30 to 45 seconds. Uh, go I'll, ahead, I'll John. Take, I'll take it, I'll take it. Uh, just the example is the Michigan Geologic Survey started here back at Western Michigan in 2011, and we've been working trying to show that we needed more geology. It's a result of that presentation and the fact that we've been able to show through our mapping program that we can identify potentially new water resources, particularly in Cass County and other areas. That's how we received 500,000 in 216, 500,000 in 218, and we just received on October 1 in these times of budget cutbacks, another 500,000 for the geologic survey to continue to do those work. We've been running along with this group in showing that we needed to have real science and real data. So that's my point is that I think that we have some good examples right now, uh, even with the survey. This how we've been working forward and trying to get positive and we can show some gains. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, Dave Hamilton. Yeah, I just wanted to point out that the department won't be doing all of this work, and that seemed to be one of the things that Doug was concerned about is uh, their capacity. We do have to worry about their capacity, but a lot of these things, uh, others will be hired to actually do uh, most of the work. Okay. Thanks, everybody. So to wrap up really quick, kind of on, kind of on this, uh, you know, on this topic of report 
uh, on the report construction and the timeline we're going to we're going to get to uh, after after Dave gives us the quick update on on the Cass County uh, model. We're going to get to our follow up meetings that are going to be coming up before our report is due at the end of December. Um, I, I have talked with Christine Spitzley and and have made the commitment that the changes that have been approved today uh, we're going to we're going to get into that draft. Uh, and make sure everything is updated uh, to the best of our ability. I'm going to get that to her to, by tomorrow so that she can at with top speed get it out to the to everybody on the mailing list so that you guys can review the report, make sure you're comfortable with it with the write ups um, so that we can get to the point where you're getting it back to Christine by Christine. When did we say when did we say you needed to get comments on the back? I believe we said in a week. So, uh, so next Friday, the thirtieth, you need him back. That we can we can work with that. Okay, so so we're gonna so we're gonna try to get get this stuff out to you by by tomorrow or Thursday at the latest, but hopefully tomorrow, um, so that you've got a week to review this stuff to get it to get comments back. And again, this shouldn't be too new to you because you've seen all these recommendations. There's other than grammar there's not a whole lot of you know there's not a whole lot of stuff that was done to those recommendations that you've already approved this is just looking at it making sure especially the introductory language is is, is a comfort for you uh so that then when we're re when we come back to meet in november we're ready to kind of give it the final sign off to say yep this is this is what we're going to do this is this is how we're going to move forward this is what what we're going to present in december uh so that december can be you know our our discussion of champions and uh, you know all the discussions with the legislature so thank you guys appreciate your feedback perfect thank you thank you both all right moving along quickly dave hamilton uh you want to give us a brief update on um, some of the things that have happened as follow-up to the cass county um pilot study model yes yeah, i'll be very quick on this so we had a uh, models committee meeting some time ago if uh where we went into the details of the current Cass County model. If you want to see that, um, it's recorded and available somewhere. But um, there were a lot of concerns that were raised at the meeting. It was very clear that the department was not going to accept um, this model. And uh, there's a lot of us that want to see it stop. Uh, we think that having a, a successful model at this scale is very important for the program. We think this is an important area to um, get a model completed. Uh, the data set that's been generated as part of this is really phenomenal. And uh, so there's a lot of interest in uh, seeing this model, uh, some more work done on it and bring it to a successful conclusion. Uh, so Jim Ellis and I, co-chairs of the model committee, agreed to facilitate uh, some further explanation, exploration as to what could be done. And so we had a, uh, what started out as a pretty small technical meeting um, with the original modeler and some others that have modeling expertise. Uh, it grew to um, have some of the funders of it, which were actually a very important uh, group to have involved as well. So we have some very good discussion. We have laid out a, um, a, a plan of attack as to what can be done with this model to move it forward. Um, we have um, worked up some guidelines. Uh, Todd uh, Feenstra has a, uh, a work plan. Now, uh, the caveat on that is assuming that the funders are willing to go forward, I have actually not heard uh, if the decision has been made on that or not. Laura may know um, if it has or not, but if it has, uh, the next step is for Todd to come up with a work plan and we've got a process worked out where there'll be an iterative um, uh, development as the model is uh, going through its, its uh, uh, fine tuning and recalibration and all the good things that still need to be done. It'll be an iterative process to make sure that uh, there's agreement on it as it moves forward and the hope is to have a, a calibrated model where there's broad agreement and it can use uh, by this program down the road. So that's where we're at. Any questions? Dave, just to add to that, it is confirmed Todd's going to get started working on that work plan. The funders Excellent. agreed that they that they wanted him to get started. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. All right. I don't see any raised hands. I appreciate hearing that as well and um, and tracking it. That sounds like a very positive development um, and I will look forward to you guys all coming back and kind of continuing to keep the full water council up to up to speed on how that develops. Um, so 
Next agenda item is uh, just to reiterate our next meetings. The next one up is November 10th. And as Laura mentioned, I mean, that's the time crunch for the report drafting turnarounds um, is so that we can get that to you so you can review it and then get your comments back so we can review it again and modify it and have it to discuss at the November 10th. Um, the, the, the meeting following that will be December 15th. And I think at the previous meeting, if I remember right, we decided that we would be continuing with this uh, one o'clock start time. Um, so expect to see some uh, schedulers for that. And um, next item is open comments. Uh, we are almost out of time and seeing as how we've um, we did do public comment um, does I will ask do any participants um, today right now have any urgent uh, or imperative comments to make during this time Laura Campbell I've oh, got to unmute myself there. Um, I just want to say, number one, I am so, so grateful to everybody who is participating in this process. I hope you are willing to continue. Uh, unlike kind of what, what happened with the last council where it was a gigantic effort and then it was kind of like, whew, now we're done. Now everybody can walk away grinning. Uh, I hope you are all willing to continue with your sleeves rolled up and continue this effort because you've been awesome to work with so far. So I am looking forward to getting this report done and then immediately starting back in on the next one. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, I will it, I will echo the same thing in that um, I, I have been participating in another similar uh, structured group who is going through the process of figuring out how they will function and cover breadth and depth. And um, it has made me not take um, this water council for granted, um, whether it's your relationships, your dedication, your ability to go into committees and talk out details, emerge and kind of arrive at consensus. I'm um, I was reminded that that is uh, not to be taken for granted and I appreciate it a lot. Um, so thank you all. Uh, Tom Frazier. Yeah, uh, thank you, Brian. I just wanted to make a comment. I was uh, reviewing some minutes earlier today and uh, noticed that the November 10th meeting had been added. I was trying to add that to my own calendar and apparently sent out uh, an invitation to everybody uh, for that. Uh, so if you receive that, please ignore that. I think that will be coming from Eagle at the appropriate time. So I apologize for any confusion. No problem. No problem. Thank you for thank you for stating that, Tom. I appreciate it. Tom, it's a good thing you didn't title it as some like disparaging thing when you send it out to everybody. <laughs> Yes, I am thankful for that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, I'm going to check the chat box here. It looks like we're pretty good there. Um, I'm not seeing any last hands raised. So uh, with that, uh, it is four o'clock and I would accept a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by Frank Etowagishik. All right. By Second by Yelich. Uh, any opposed? All right. Thank you all tremendously. We are adjourned. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and your dedication. We're getting there. Thank Good you, guys. Work, everybody. Thank you. Right. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye, everybody. Be safe.